Podmortem would like to thank Original Cinematic for sponsoring this week's episode. Original Cinematic is an independent production company that has made it their mission to create, produce, and promote films that are inclusive, honor women, promote the LGBTQIA community, and provide prominent positions and roles to POC actors and filmmakers, and promote the films of marginalized and underrepresented populations. These are all things that are extremely important to our podcast as well. Original Cinematic is proud to be a WGA signatory company, and they fully stand by the WGA, SAG, and their members in their fight for extremely reasonable standards. Accordingly, they are not accepting script or treatment submissions at this time, but both William and Zena Rush are available via email free of charge to discuss writing and provide input and resources to all aspiring writers. Their information will be made available in the show notes. Ahead of the strike, William Rush has individually produced numerous projects, including Coffee with Baba, Day by Day, They Slay, Before, Pack is Here, Abiquue, The Winemaker, and Where Do You Draw the Line? Two feature films, Group and Immersion, are slated for release this fall. Absolutely no picket lines will be crossed and no collective bargaining agreements will be violated in the making of either of these films. And very generously, Original Cinematic is providing all Podmortem patrons with a special link to view these films. If arrangements can be made, they will even schedule a virtual or in-person screening for our patrons. We cannot thank Original Cinematic enough for their contribution to our show and the horror community as a whole. Now... Back to our regularly scheduled program. Salutations! Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez, joined as always by my co-hosts, my husband and my brother. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. Hi, I'm Travis Hunter. This week, we're recording live from the Tilden Morgue and Crematorium, discussing the 2016 supernatural horror film, The Autopsy of Jane Doe. This film was directed by Andre Overdahl and written by Ian Goldberg and Richard Nang. The Autopsy of Jane Doe is a departure from what audiences would expect thanks to committed performances, skillful direction, and an impressive blacklist featured script. Combined with realistic practical effects, accurate medical depictions, and supernatural scares, this film is hailed as a hidden gem among many horror fans. This film was requested to us by friends of the show, Macy McDonald, Jenny Fogelman, Molly Gerhardt, Mozzie Bear, Towton Watson, Cookie, and William Rush. We want to thank them all for their support as well as this suggestion. This film was also the winner of our October Patreon poll. So thank you to all of our patrons who participated and voted. If you want to help us pick an episode, join us over on the Patreon at patreon.com slash the podmortem. So what did you guys think of the autopsy of Jane Doe the first time you saw it? So I I know that I kept telling you that I had thought that we had seen this. Yes. Um, but we did see this. No, I'm just kidding. I was <laughs> like, mm, no, we didn't. Um, this was the first time me seeing it. Um, I did enjoy it. It 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 left me with some questions, but I did enjoy what was going on here, and I did like a lot of the visuals and like stuff, like the scenes and everything. Um, what a ride. I will say that too. The movie does do a very good job of taking you on a ride and everything that we do experience in the movie or they experience, but we're along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's great. It's, they do a really good job of, I guess, creating the vehicle of us just kind of seeing how this is playing out Yeah, for the actors in the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I, I really, I did enjoy this movie. It was pretty good. I remember Nay and I watched this shortly before the pandemic. Uh-huh. And so there was a lot of films of that era that are just lost to time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like shaking an Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I was telling Jules last night that it felt like watching a new movie to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because so much of it was gone, but there was some bits of familiarity 
like a vague recognition. Yeah. And so there was an odd feeling of nostalgia, even though this movie's not that old. No. Yeah. But it was very cool to revisit it. Uh, love the atmosphere of it so much. There are some very, very, <laughs> very unsettling moments. Mm -hmm. I think that this is kind of the perfect cold weather late night film. Okay. To watch in the autumn season, which is perfect that we're covering it. Yeah. yeah. And I do think that I don't hear enough people talk about it, but when I do hear people talk about it, it's always how much they love it. Yeah. Which is wonderful because I think that this is a film that can kind of really be one to revisit a lot. Uh huh. It's got a comforting feel to it, even though it's very dark and uh, very upsetting in a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for me, I love the mystery. The mystery of it's very fun. The performances are great. I love the music. Um, the story of it, I am very intrigued by. I like where they go with a lot of it. I do think that as much as I love the buildup of the first two acts of the film... I do think the third act gets a little formulaic. Mm -hmm. It's not what was before, but it, it doesn't ruin the film. Yeah. yeah. I still enjoy it. And it's like you said, that that, that part is especially the thrill ride. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of fun with it. I just, uh, there are some times that I'm like, ah, you're better than that, man. Yeah. <laughs> I no, don't yeah. do that. <laughs> but I still enjoy it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that it is because I there was a few times when I was watching it and I was like, that's, that's just very cliche. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like you're just doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You you know, that's that's your character. <laughs> that's it. And it's like, I it did feel like that. You know better. Mm -hmm. These characters, it's like you should know better. And but it's, it's like, uh, it sets up moments kind of almost like a haunted house attraction. Yeah. And it's a lot of it is payoff from what we've learned before. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's not really much to complain about. But it is kind of what you set up. This isn't the same. Yeah. That's fair. I feel like when something, when you're on this ride and it is so, almost feels like a slow burn at first and things that are happening are happening very subtly and there's a lot of um, foreshadowing mm -hmm. in some instances. There's a lot of setup. When those moments happen, I know that I should be like, damn it, like do better, go back. But <laughs> they, they've they already won me over. So I'm yeah. like, that's fine. That's okay. I'll, I'll forgive you for that. You know, <laughs> yeah. I overall think that this is really fantastic. This has been on our most requested list for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and like you, when we had watched it together right before the pandemic, that's the only time I'd ever seen it too. And I remembered that I liked it, but I did not remember it being as good as I found it when I watched it this time. There are moments that are straight up unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the medical stuff that they do, it is not over the top. It is not like shock value gore. It seems very realistic. And yeah. I watched a lot of interviews and they had a, a morgue worker there to make sure that it was accurate. And um, they had mentioned Brian Cox specifically wanting to make sure that the procedures he used were accurate and correct. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that just, it comes through so much and you can tell the care and thought that was put into it when a lot of movies, we can't even get them to use an inhaler correctly. Oh, God. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that, to me, it, it means a lot. Oh, yeah. And for me, I think that's just kind of what this film is. I feel like there's nods to classic horror. I feel like it's very smart. And even those kind of formulaic and um, cliched moments that happen at the end, they were foreshadowed in a way yeah. that if you go back and watch it again, you're like, oh, shit, that's what, you know? And there's nothing wrong with those moments. Yeah. I, I just feel like um, I, I appreciate the suspense that they build. Yeah. And sometimes it feels like um, more of a scare, like a jump scare thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like they, it's like you guys were, I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you were <laughs> close. that close. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I, I will call it, like you said, these homages to classic horror. Yeah. There's at least three films that I can think of that we'll get to mm -hmm. that I'm like, thank you for all of these. Yeah. yeah. I did want to touch on some of the production from what I've put together from like uh, interviews and articles that I've read with Andre Overdahl. Um, how he kind of articulated that it started it's when he went to see the conjuring in 2013 and he said that he was um really blown away by kind of like the classical approach that the film had to its scares and its setup 
And I, cause he had done Troll Hunter. Mm hmm. And he kind of made it sound like he wasn't really interested in doing more horror because he didn't want to be like typecast and expected to just kind of keep doing Troll Hunter over and over again. Okay. And so he said that he had called his agent and was like, let me know if you find a good horror script, like a very thoughtful, well-written horror script. So he said a month later, he was sent the script for Autopsy of Jane Doe. And I know that I had mentioned at the top that it was on the blacklist, which to my understanding is a list of scripts that people loved, but did not choose to pursue, right? Yeah, basically. They're the best written, unproduced scripts. What? Yeah. Yeah. So that's how good it was. Everybody was like, this is really great, but no thanks, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Why? Yeah, I, I don't guess know. They're like, look out for these next year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <well. laughs> but if it's good, wouldn't you want to attempt to try to make it? Maybe they're just trying to find the right time. Oh, yeah. too salty. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. quite. Um, but it was sent to him, and he said that he wasn't even on the list of directors that were in mind for it because of troll hunter and because this is so different so he said that and he was like he said multiple times so much luck went into this happening and we'll talk about um casting i guess once we start talking about that character Mm -hmm. but that was an aspect of it too but he said that um him seeing the conjuring being interested in doing horror again, being sent this script a month later, not even being considered for it. And then he happened to be working with two of the producers for it. So he talked to them and they were like, okay. And that's how he ended up doing it. That's cosmic. Exactly. (laughs) Um, He said that he had read it in one sitting and it scared the hell out of him. He couldn't put it down. He was so intrigued by the horror of it and by um, the, uh, relationship between the father and son that we meet and he had said that and we'll talk about who was supposed to play the father later but that didn't end up working out he got brian cox and he said when you get brian cox to do something then everybody's like okay what is this yeah. you know because <laughs> it's fucking brian cox oh, yeah. yeah so that's how emil hirsch signed on and um he said they started production in uh, March of 2015. It hit the Toronto International Film Festival in 2016 and then was in September, I guess, and then was released widely in December. And it's, again, one of those movies that the people that have seen it talk about how great it is and the other people have never seen it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so bizarre how I feel like this should be talked about a lot more, especially when it came out Yeah, and the other movies that came out around it. That is true, and with you mentioning it, I do feel this classical horror influence. Yeah. yeah. It does kind of feel timeless in its own way that this could really take place whenever. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think that the way that the atmosphere is crafted, it does kind of give an air of kind of 70s, 80s. It does. It does. So I feel it. No, yeah. You know what? That's right. Because there's a part that happens. And when it happened, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, oh, you had that the whole time? But I I, I was like, what? But yeah, you don't. And I will say this. uh, Hearing hearing you, you know what I mean? Give the background about this. I do feel that. Because watching this, I'm not going to lie. It kind of made me feel like, man... I what the you know what I mean with the right ideas whatever I bet we could we could yeah. make a a horror movie it this is not saying that this is like cheaply made but the y- the love you can tell that went into this yeah yeah you can tell the care that went into this yeah. and I love a good contained horror film yeah mm-hmm. that takes place in what like that is so that is a couple points to me by itself yeah (laughs) all honesty i love that i think that it's really inventive the way that people use these small spaces like Mm -hmm. this yeah this film does a really good job it really does kind of inspire you to want to make your own it does all we just we just need a morgue and a body yeah (laughs) (laughs) well it's like they weren't even in a morgue Oh yeah, so, we yeah. could do it in the kitchen or something. Yeah, and they don't. This is like, a morgue now. Yeah, yeah it's like this, <laughs> for this, the purposes yeah. of this. <laughs> it's like no, yeah, I believe it. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> now, before we find cause of death for this film, we would like to show a warning for spoilers. Podmortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, then let's make the incision. 
The film opens with wind blowing. The leaves rustle as we look down on the dark ground. The fierce wind blows as the title comes into view. The Autopsy of Jane Doe. I do want to say with the opening of the film, I really appreciated seeing the IFC logo. Mm -hmm. There's a powerful nostalgia. Oh, absolutely. So you're already starting off with several points. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Immediately, we're transported to the daytime. The views of leaves hazy and upside down. The view corrects, turning right side up and coming into view. We see a suburban home, a truck in the driveway, and a bright green, freshly mowed lawn. Text informs us that we're in Grantham, Virginia. I just had a couple things here. I liked the twisting shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of the shots in this film. Yeah. The cinematographer was a guy called Roman Osen. And he was the director of photography on Pride and Prejudice. Oh. Okay. But he was also the director of photography on Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Oh, oh, nice. oh and? Yes. Yeah. Which was directed by Overdahl. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, he got the job for that because Guillermo del Toro was a fan of this. Oh, oh nice. Wow. All right. <laughs> I liked that movie. That was It was really fun. Yeah. And growing up reading the books. Yeah. yeah. More nostalgia. Mm-hmm. I will say, I don't know that we need the subtitle of Grantham, Virginia. Well, no. It's, it's very nitpicky. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. We do. Well, not really. We do. Oh, no. We'll talk yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Well, but they say a thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, we don't but, fucking oh, yeah. need it. I feel like I feel like th- putting it there, it felt like an episode of the X-Files. I would have preferred <laughs> <laughs> if we kind of just, because you hear it on the radio later, and I'm like, that's enough. I guess. All right. That's kind of <laughs> nitpicky. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, I said that. I told you it was nitpicky. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I told you. (laughs) In the yard, on a stark white table adorned with matching chairs, sits a mug on a saucer and a cigarette resting in an ashtray. Betraying the picturesque and serene setting outside of the house, on the inside, crime scene investigators snap photos of the interior. There are numbered tags placed on a blood stained carpet, marking the position of evidence a bloody knife, an abandoned shoe. In the next room, strewn lifeless on the floor, is the body of a woman, Carol Douglas. Light flashes as she's photographed, and we see a blood-streaked receiver for a landline phone at her feet. There's a dropped gun on the ground. In another room, the dead body of a man, Paul Douglas, his eyes open and staring lifelessly, lies on a rug. Sheriff Burke, played by Michael McElliton, kneels over him before heading upstairs. He steps over another lifeless body in the hallway and pushes open a door marred by bloody bullet holes. He looks out of the window into the driveway below and sees a news van pull up, stopped just short of the police tape lining the perimeter of the home. We're just thrown into this shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's rough. Yeah. Tell me if I'm the only one, because I know that there are some homages later, kind of. Uh huh. For me, I'm feeling some very interesting like parallels between this movie and John Carpenter's The Thing. Okay. I'm feeling, especially with this, is almost like when McCready goes to investigate the other camp and sees. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then we kind of get to understand what happened here yeah, through yeah. the course of the movie. Yeah. And so I felt that, that parallel, and I appreciated it yeah i did not pick up on that but yeah that's super fair but burke's radio crackles to life with someone telling him that he needs to get down here burke follows instruction making his way down to the basement his flashlight cuts through the darkness revealing trails of blood up and down the walls he joins his colleagues standing over a newly dug hole in the basement floor sticking out of the hole is the body of a woman nude pale and dead this is our jane doe played by olwen Catherine kelly so i mean this isn't something you see every day but let's no. no i think the thing for me is there i i just there is not enough reaction to the fact that it seems like she is built into the house yeah yeah okay it's not as if she's buried in like a pit of dirt yeah she looks like she's part of the foundation from the ground like yeah. yeah and that's and she looks she looks like she's made of porcelain yeah she does yeah it's 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 it is very underwhelming and it, it's almost like you're waiting for the record scratches. Like you're probably wondering how <laughs> yeah. I got here. This should be a bigger reaction. Yeah. She's, what the fuck? What? She's not like the other no. uh, corpses in no. the house. Who all died violently, clearly. Mm-hmm. And but they're just like, huh. 
<laughs> yeah, but so but, three corpses, <laughs> four, four corpses. But you are right; half of her body is like in the foundation in the dirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Burke asks if there's an ID on her and is told no, only that there's no relation to Paul and Carol, the couple upstairs. The group is joined by Lieutenant Wade, played by Jane Perry. She asks who the body is, and Sheriff says that for now, she's just Jane Doe. He asks if she's got anything, and Wade reports that nothing was stolen. There's not even a scratch on the outside of the house, so it doesn't look like anyone broke in. If anything, it looks like they were trying to break out. That's horrifying. Yes. And again. Why are you casually saying (laughs) that? (laughs) We zoom in on Jane Doe's still face and the screen goes white with the flash of a camera. When we come back, we are in the halls of the Tilden Morgue and Crematorium. The building is nice and cozy, illuminated when the overhead lights flicker on one by one. We see framed photos of a family, husband, wife, and son, standing in front of the home, the sign boasting their establishment in 1919. We glide down the halls as the calm music continues, but suddenly the serene piano is replaced with midnight black by the temperance movement. The soft plushness of the home is replaced with the harsh metal of the autopsy room behind the double doors. I wanted to call out the score in this film Mm -hmm. because that pensive piano was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like every bit of music that accompanies the scares that come later, Mm -hmm. the eerie tension, there's one shot that something very not common happens. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not common <All> right. <laughs> I don't want to give too much away yeah yeah <laughs> it's out of the ordinary it's, it's yeah. us. <laughs> I guess I could say that yeah. instead <laughs> but um the the score is very very good yeah but I wanted to call it the composers it was Sonder Jurians and Danny Benzi and they scored the film Enemy they scored The Lodge. Okay. They scored Fear the Walking Dead. Oh. They scored The One I Love. It's a brilliant film. I don't know okay. if you've seen it. Mm-mm. Mark Duplass and Elizabeth. Uh, oh, I like Mark Duplass. Elizabeth uh, Moss. Oh, all I right, like Elizabeth right. Moss. Her acting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, yes. Um, and they scored Ozark, the TV show. Ooh, oh, okay. Very good. But so everything I've seen from them, they're brilliant, brilliant composers. Yeah. I also wanted to say that I was very surprised that Tommy was allowing this music to be played during the, <laughs> he seemed like it would, he would have that creep show reaction of you turn that off yeah. and you turn that off right, right now, <laughs> but he just let it go. Yeah. it. I know. And, and I know you said it earlier about the nitpicky. Uh-huh. And for me, this was another cliche thing. The whole, uh, the medical examiners are the morgue workers. We're going to, rock out why we cut open these bodies and be super calm and <laughs> eat a sandwich and it's like dude <laughs> it's like really <laughs> it's funny because it, it seems like screenwriters have one way to show that they're desensitized yeah it's like music <laughs> like, no, I can eat. and food <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> they should have had a cd player like on nip tuck and oh. been playing like yes cause of All death right. related music yeah <laughs> <laughs> But here in the autopsy room, Austin, played by Emil Hirsch, listens to the music as he snaps photos of the man on the table and Otis Howard. The decedent is horribly burned, only one eye staring out blindly from his charred face. Austin hands tools over to his father, Tommy, played by Brian Cox. Who we love. Yes. Oh, yeah. We just talked about him on Zodiac. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a laundry list. Yeah, we could go Super on Super Troopers. Super Troopers. Yeah. X-Men. <laughs> yes. And we were talking about he was in the campaign. He it's wa- funny <laughs> how an actor of this caliber will still do silly shit like yeah. that. That yeah. just, I love it. He, we also talked about him on The Ring. Yeah, yes. he was. Trick he, or treat. Yes. He did video game work. Yes. Yeah, he was on Manhunt, dude. Kill Zone 3. I mean... You guys need to watch Succession. I know, okay, yeah. I know, because I know he's in that. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> he's in <laughs> it. <laughs> um, but when Overdahl was talking about how everything kind of fell into place, Martin Sheen was going to play Tommy. I could see that. Yeah. It, the way that they had it scheduled and something had happened and they had to push back months. And so when they were going to be 
either beginning or in the middle, Martin Sheen was already obligated to do something else. He mm-hmm. was like, I can't. So he dropped out. And that's when Brian Cox read it and was like, oh, well, I'm very interested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if things had gone according to their first plan, this would have been Martin Sheen. I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like he could. He has that presence. Yeah. But I prefer Brian Cox. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And I, I read as well that he is not very interested in horror films as a genre, really. Really? Yeah, but I feel like anything that I've seen him in, no matter the genre, he is a standout. He excels. Yeah. yeah. And he had said that for him, this role was about the character work and the dynamic between him and Austin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that is a strength of the film. I would like a little more, but I feel like what they do is enough to make you care about them. Yeah. yeah. Which is not always the standard. Mm-hmm. Right. But Tommy performs the autopsy, cutting open the chest cavity and weighing the organs as the camera films the process. Austin writes the body's name, nasal cavity damaged, on the chalkboard on the other side of the room. He did misspell it looked like two thirds of the diagnosis, but that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's their shorthand. He knows what yeah. it means. Okay, okay. <laughs> The music continues as the father and son finish the procedure, putting organs and vials into the fridge, removing Howard's brain, and finally tossing the bloody instruments into the sink to be sanitized. The song fades out as they wash their hands side by side in the sinks. Tommy asks for the cause of death, but Austin asks if they can just skip this part tonight. Tommy isn't trying to hear it, though, pointing out that the question he asked was a softball. Standing over the body, Austin casually guesses, smoke inhalation? As Tommy dries his hands, he asks if that's really what he thinks killed Mr. Howard. Austin points out the damaged nasal cavity, throat, and lungs, but Tommy only co-signs on the damaged lungs, though they're not incompatible with life. Austin assumes that his father is saying that means it's not the cause of death. Tommy only cautions Austin to look before he leaps. This is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I feel like it says a lot about Tommy as a character. It does. And it says a lot about Austin of kind of what he needs to do. Yeah. Uh, Again, appreciate this dynamic. Yeah. I will say the way that Brian... (laughs) Brian? Brian? (laughs) I didn't realize. I was on set that day and he was just, he was killing it. Uh, (laughs) The way that Tommy Mm -hmm. kind of gently is like, kind of don't take the easy way mm-hmm. um, because Tommy is clearly just trying to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And he's still being patient and being like, look, dude, think about it. Don't just grab the easiest answer or whatever. Reminded me of my dad. Yes. Which really made me like, uh, I'm like already I have a soft spot for this character. And he said maybe four sentences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a moment later where they share, a, he, he gives a very supportive, uh, some words of wisdom yeah Yeah. when he seems kind of doubtful at his own performance and it's like this relationship is great yeah no yeah i I think that's like what you were saying uh, a little bit ago t the the way they play off each other it's great yeah like i do believe that they're father and son yeah Mm -hmm. and the casting they look similar yeah yeah but tommy recaps the situation asking austin where the police found the body the kitchen Tommy continues that the house was on fire and the front door was 30 feet away, but he wasn't trying to get there. His lungs are damaged, but the airways aren't denuded enough. Austin finally catches on. Howard stopped breathing before the fire got going. Tommy tells Austin to open up the body and he does. Using a pin light, Tommy points out an occipital fracture in Howard's head. Austin realizes that that explains the swelling in the brain. Tommy agrees, a subdural hematoma. That's what killed Howard, not the smoke. He imparts the wisdom onto his son that everybody has secrets. Some are just better at hiding them. With a smirk, Austin adds that some people are just better at finding them. But Tommy assures his son that he did good and he'll get there. That's very sweet. Yeah. Yeah. As he gets ready to leave, Austin points out that no one has even come to claim Howard. He says that that's why he died, because he was alone. Tommy looks at it realistically. He died because he fell and hit his head. Austin's phone begins to ring, and he tells Tommy that his girlfriend, Emma, wants to go see a movie at The Strand. 
Tommy says that he thought that place was closed down, but chuckling, Austin tells him no, asking when the last time he even went to see a movie was. No, the Strand is still open. Sex Cauldron was closed down. That's what was closed down. (laughs) Yes. I did want to say Austin making mention of somebody dying because they were alone, it very much seems like it's hinting at another plot line that Tommy's going through Mm -hmm. and a worry that Austin has for what he is planning to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thought that was very subtle and very good screenwriting. It is. Yeah. But Tommy actually ponders his last trip to the movies, giving him the vague plot of the notebook, unable to remember the name. Austin identifies the film and Tommy admits that Austin's mom made him go see it with her for her birthday, but he fell asleep five minutes in. The smile slowly fades from Austin's face and after a moment of quiet awkwardness, Tommy indicates the body, asking if Austin will be all right finishing him up. As soon as Austin says yes, Tommy leaves. I know it's kind of become a recurring thing to call out some funny subtitles that pop up, (laughs) but he looks back at the body and he goes, subdural hematoma, because that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. But the subtitles, and we, their last name is Tilden because it's the Tilden funeral home. Yeah. But the subtitles said, instead of subdural hematoma, they said, what's up, Tilden? (laughs) (laughs) Hematoma. (laughs) (laughs) And Uh, I I laughed. (laughs) (laughs) Just put the shrug emoji. Yeah, yeah just, you know, it's just or inaudible or yeah, something. Just, <laughs> you didn't hear it. Or I don't know. Yeah, the parentheses. <laughs> All right, <laughs> he didn't know what they said. <laughs> it's like why would he say yeah. it to himself? <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't even make sense. Nope. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I did not see that. That's so but funny. But you kept Timotoma. Yeah. I was like, you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> 50-50, you know. Right half a That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but Tommy taps the flickering light outside the door, setting it straight before walking down the hall, his reflection in the mirror in the corner of the ceiling. He puts on his coat and lets himself out through the cellar doors. I love how much we see this mirror. Yes. Inconsequentially. Mm-hmm. When we talk about his influence of James Wan on making this film, yeah, you almost see that little bit of what James Wan does of showing the environment. Yeah. Because yeah. he walks us, and we've already been through the funeral home. Yeah. But to go there again and then to set up little slight shots that we're going to see again later in different contexts, mm-hmm. it's very good. And to see the very easy and accessible way out through the cellar. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> As of right now. But once outside in the crisp air, Tommy lights a cigarette and takes a long drag. In front of the house, we see the weathered sign for the Tilden Morgue and crematorium. In the autopsy room, Austin fills out the card for Howard's freezer door. He pauses when he hears rumbling, presumably coming from the open vent on the wall. He silently dismisses this, though, and finishes the task at hand, sliding the card into the slot on the door. As he starts to walk away, the vent rattles again. But when he looks over, Stanley the cat, played by Sydney, Very good. comes crawling through. I love when we credit these animals. It's oh, yeah. my favorite thing. I will say, as much as I appreciate Tommy so far, uh, new favorite character. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley lands on the ground, dropping a dead mouse before hopping away. Austin picks up the mouse by its tail, calling out to his dad that Stanley found another one and tossing it into the trash before washing his hands. There is a loud thudding sound outside the door and concerned, Austin calls out for his dad again. When he doesn't receive an answer, he walks down the hallway, reflected in that same mirror in the corner. He continues down the hall and peeks into an office, but finds no trace of his dad. Suddenly, someone jumps out behind him, yelling. He's scared, but it's only Emma, played by Ophelia Lovey Bond. She laughs, telling him how easy he was to get. Austin doesn't understand how she got down here, but Emma says that they left the key in the elevator. Looking around, she admits that this isn't what she was expecting, even though he did say it was old. Austin reminds her that they were supposed to meet up front, but she says that she got tired of waiting and wanted to take a look around. They walk down the way Austin came, Emma commenting that the place just keeps going and going. Austin says that three generations of Tildens kept expanding it. He tries to rush her out, but she's made her way into the autopsy room and asks him, why the rush? 
I will say that I looked at, I paused and I didn't notice that it paused on the mirror in the corner. Uh huh. And for the and I was like, there's got to be something there. <laughs> and I kept looking. I was like, there's nothing there. <laughs> but even that, just as far as we've gotten to the movie now, nothing. I don't want to say nothing really has happened because there is stuff that has happened, but nothing like too, too spooky yet. Yeah. But already at this point, I was already looking in windows mm -hmm. and in cracks and wherever. And I was like, something's got to happen. So, so I'm already kind of getting sucked into the movie without even realizing that I'm getting, you know what I mean? That yeah. I'm, yeah, you're primed. Yeah. And I think that's why that false jump scare actually works for me. Okay. With the cat? With the cat and with his girlfriend. Yeah. Mm. Because it's like, you're already on edge. Yeah. You're waiting for something. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm very much on board. Yeah. Another thing I noticed when they were going, and I don't know if maybe it was just because when he's explaining to her about how they kept expanding and whatever, and we see them walking through the halls, they go through one where it looks like there's scratches all along the wall. But I like on both sides, but I didn't know if maybe really? it was just like wear and tear if it was like trying to show the age of the building because mm -hmm. he is saying that about how they've been expanding. But it it did look a little not odd, but kind of like, well, what is that from? What is that? You know what yeah. I mean? yeah. No, I that's probably what it is because I feel like it's a really important plot point how long this has been in the family and yeah. how it's kind of understood that it's always going to be in the family yeah and i will say i did read an interview with matt gant who is the production designer and that was one of the challenges is trying to make this place appear as if it has been around since what 1919 okay yes. yeah and i feel like they really accomplished that with small things like yeah, that yeah all right where you're like even the wall has a story yeah, yeah that makes sense then they did a good job yeah. yeah they did but austin tells emma that he's been down here all day Emma, though, argues that he gets to see her at her work and she just wants the same. Austin reminds her that she works at a bookstore. <laughs> this is not the same <laughs> no. thing. Emma slowly walks around the table, taking it all in as she makes her way to the wall of freezer drawers. She asks if they're all full of people and Austin says that tonight there's just three. She wants to see one, but Austin rushes over, telling her an emphatic no. No. When she insists, he reasons that there are just some things that you can't unsee. Austin tells her no again, citing the other reason is that his dad is just way too strict. Appearing in the doorway behind them and taking a sip from a mug, Tommy tells them to try him. <laughs> this is my dad. Yes. Like, <laughs> I feel like it's just more and more. It's confirmation. Well, I will say that this is this is our dad in behavior, but our dad yes. is much more ethical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no, take a fucking yeah, peek. Look at the corpses. I'm sure that's not against any rules. <laughs> I'm sure you won't get my license revoked. <laughs> oh, you're curious? Go for oh, it. Oh, you went on one date with my son? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean more the snark. Yeah, yeah. The snark. yeah. that's right. true. That is true. But, but it, it is like, hey, whoa, whoa, hold on, dad. I just told her yeah. you were strict and you're... It's like, no, say, yeah. you need yeah. to yeah. agree. Seriously, I don't want to see this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you tell when I'm using you as an excuse? <laughs> but Tommy asks which one she wants to see. Austin is appalled, asking if he's serious. But after Tommy asks Emma if she is, and she replies with a big smile and a hell yeah, he asks again, which one does she want to see? Emma points to the middle door, but Austin walks over to the one on the far left. It's marked with the name Irene Daniels, played by Mary Duddy. He opens the door, the body with its sewed mouth and eyes jostling as it settles into place. Emma corrects him that she picked the middle one. Austin argues that one body is as good as another, but Emma insists that she wants the one she picked. Austin closes the drawer and walks over to the middle one, marked Louis Tannis, played by Mark Phoenix. Emma glances at Tommy nervously for a second as Austin opens the drawer. The bell on Tannis's ankle jingles as the slab is pulled out. We don't see a sewed up eyes and mouth because the sheet rests on what appears to be a concave face. Austin looks at his dad and Emma approaches the drawer and Tommy takes another sip from his mug as he giggles. This is the most unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> Emma asks what the bell around the ankle is for and Tommy tells her it's to make sure he's dead. There was a time when it was hard to tell a comatose body from a dead body and the coroners tied bells to everyone in the morgue so if they heard a sound, they'd know someone was alive. 
He was like, have you seen the motion picture The Nun? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say I don't I think this might have come out first actually. It did. But um I think. I don't know. 2018? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is first then. Yes. Um I, I feel like this and what we're obviously setting up is much more effective than what we got in that film. A yes. thousand percent. Yeah. And I really appreciate what they do with this here because again, it's one small sound. Mm-hmm. And if you can make one small sound frightening, yeah, yeah. that's great work. Oh yeah. Remember when <laughs> The tombstone literally had his name on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you it's so easy whatever, yeah. to find you. <laughs> whatever, <dude>. whatever. <laughs> I can't go back there. <laughs> Don't make me go back Don't there. Don't make me. <laughs> but Emma asks why Tommy does it, and he explains simply that he's a bit of a traditionalist. Looking down at the sheet, Emma asks why they covered his face, and Tommy tells her quickly that there wasn't much of a face to cover due to a point blank gunshot blast. Emma wants to know who shot him, and while Tommy admits that the angle did indicate that he did it to himself, the strychnine in his system let them know that he was dead before the shot. Emma asks why anyone would do that, and Tommy tells her that she sounds like Austin now. The why is up to the shrinks and the cops. It's their job to determine the cause of death. No more and no less. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know why he's like, but every death is a mystery here. <laughs> it's a fun game that we play. <laughs> it's like, cause, again, like the, the the one that we just saw on the table. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> not quite right, son. Yeah. And then this one, he's like, you would think that. <laughs> but it's like, Jesus Christ. It's a fun game. That <laughs> we love it. It's a puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> but he's right. That it. That's not their department. He's right. He's yeah. right. He's right. He is right. But I feel like where he's supposed to be coming off as kind of like, um, like d- clinical and like detached yeah. from the fact that these are real people. He's like, well, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm just telling you, this man was murdered. <laughs> but Emma slowly raises her hand and inches forward to pull the sheet off of Tannis's face. But Austin grabs her wrist, cautioning that she does not want to see that. Tommy calmly tells Austin that it's all right, and Austin lets go. Emma grabs the end of the sheet, and just as she begins to raise it, Tommy jingles the bell and scares everyone. That's dead. <laughs> That's dead. That's what I'm saying. That's it funny. Just, <laughs> that was more funny. and more. I was like, who wrote this? <laughs> Dad was a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He chuckles, causing Emma and Austin to do the same, and Austin promptly closes the drawer shut. The couple leaves down the hall, Austin taunting Emma that she's the easy one. She should have seen her face. Emma tells him that he should see his face when he doesn't get any tonight. And Austin's like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, hey, whoa, 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 <laughs> slow down. We was right. just fooling? Right what, murder? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen someone do such a quick 180. <laughs> well, you want the gabagool. <laughs> <God. Blummered>. uh, <laughs> but he offers to ply her with popcorn and sour patch kids, and she tells him that he's lucky he's cute. That's my go to movie order, so I'm on board. <laughs> they approach the elevator, and Emma asks how he gets used to it. Austin admits that you do and you don't. The elevator doors open to reveal Sheriff Burke bringing in a gurney with a full zipped body bag on top of it. Austin asks what happened, but Burke only replies with the request for Tommy. Tommy calls out from the end of the hall, telling Burke to bring her down here, and Burke wheels the gurney in that direction. Austin offers to stay to help, but Tommy tells them both to go and have fun. Before he can protest, Emma pulls Austin into the elevator. I figured it would immediately intrigue Austin. I don't know about protocol exactly, mm-hmm. but to me, it's it's kind of interesting that the sheriff himself is bringing in this body to the morgue. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, well what's going on? What kind of special case is this? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Austin does seem disturbed by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of feels like we need to figure this out quietly and quickly. And it feels very hush hush. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. But upstairs, Austin asks Emma if she saw the look on Burke's face and reasons that he wouldn't be here this late if it wasn't something important. Emma already knows what's coming next and is immediately annoyed. Austin tells her that he can't just ditch his father, and Emma finishes the sentiment. So you're ditching me again. 
Emma asks what Tommy's going to do when Austin leaves, and this causes Austin to stop walking. She realizes now that he hasn't told his father yet that he's leaving, and Austin tells her that it's not that simple. This really speaks to what you were saying, T, about him obviously being worried about Mm -hmm. his father being left alone. Mm -hmm. But Emma walks away angry. Austin stops her, telling her that he will tell him this isn't his life. He doesn't want to be Austin Tilden, the morgue worker. His dad just needs his help right now. But Emma says that it's been two years and that Tommy can take care of himself. Austin asks her to just come back in a few hours. They'll catch the midnight show and then go have a drink. When she doesn't respond, he sweetens the deal to two drinks. He promises her that at 11 o'clock, he's all hers. He tells her not to smile because a smile means yes. And of course, that makes her smile. They kiss and she leaves, telling him maybe. As she closes the door, he tells her that she's hot. (laughs) We watch as Emma drives away. So we have one thing that I appreciate, which is the very sweet relationship. Yeah. The character dynamics. And the ability of this movie, the way that things unfold, Mm -hmm. for you to forget that this conversation never happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. In the autopsy room, they unzip the bag, revealing Jane Doe once again. As Tommy looks over photographs of her as she was, sticking out of the freshly dug hole in the basement, Burke explains that she has no ID and no prints in the system. Tommy asks if they have any idea how she ended up in the basement. From the doorway, Stanley growls at them loudly until Tommy snaps at him to stop. He runs from the room and Tommy remarks that that cat gets meaner every day. (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) It's a rational explanation. (laughs) (laughs) I did want to talk about, um, we had mentioned, of course, her very pale skin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost like porcelain. There was a very interesting decision that Overdahl made when it came to the production design. Mm -hmm. I read an interview in the AV Club, and he had said that through everything that's in the morgue, even outside, there is nothing that is the color white. Oh, Oh. okay. And the intention, I would imagine, is so that she stands out completely. Yeah. And that there's no fading into any other background or anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very fascinating, and it does make her seem almost otherworldly. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Tommy continues to flip through the photos, settling on the man that was found dead upstairs. Burke identifies him as Alvarez, a man doing work on the Douglas's home. Burke presumes that Alvarez is the one that killed Jane Doe and was looking for somewhere to hide the body, but he hadn't counted on Carol and Paul being home. This is the worst theory I've ever heard. You're really f- yeah. forcing these puzzle pieces together. Yeah. So he forced her into the foundation where she's been for at least a thousand years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Maybe I want to take another crack at that, Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> Burke says that he'll bring the rest of the bodies in tomorrow, but that Jane Doe is his top priority. Austin struts in now, saying that it would have been nice to get a look at the crime scene. Tommy and Burke exchange a glance before Burke puts it simply to Austin. He's got four people dead and no clue as to how they connect. Tommy tries to cut the tension, but reminds him that they do have protocol. Burke levels with Tommy that the press is going to want answers in the morning and he doesn't have them. He can spin Alvarez and the Douglases as a B&E gone bad, but he can't sell Jane Doe. I'm still very, um, I feel some type of way about this narrative that he's just assumed. Yeah, well, he's saying I can sell it. Yeah. So you're making this up. Yeah. I yeah. Think you literally said spin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's not what happened. No. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy looks over at the body before asking the sheriff for a time frame. When he answers that it needs to be tonight, Tommy nods and says, okay. Burke leaves without another word. Tommy turns to his son and tells him that he didn't need to come back. Austin says that he knows and Tommy smiles. This is a little nitpicky too, but I wonder if it would have made more sense if like this was the mayor or something that was found dead. Like I don't understand why the media is there and why he's like, we need an answer tonight because they're going to be calling in the morning or whatever. Like, okay. I Just to like kind of bump up the urgency a yeah. little bit because otherwise I don't really why Like I don't really understand. Because really we just found three bodies. Yeah. And then this 
<laughs> this body. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and no. this extra body. Yeah. Yeah. That in the is foundation. True. And yeah. they should be the only ones to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I understand as far as like maybe small town situation, mm-hmm. 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 like this kind of thing doesn't happen here. Yeah. But at the same time, it really doesn't have that urgency if it's just a random house on a street. Yeah. yeah. So that is a fair point. But as the elevator door shuts on Burke, Saloon Rider by Matthew James Creedle, Dolphin Taylor, and Bart Hendrickson begins to play. As the riff continues, Jane Doe's name is written on the board, and the Tilden set up their instruments once again and hit record on the video. Let's do it again. <laughs> Put the music on, the gloves. Yep. And the- you thought it was over. Yeah, yeah, back at it. To the camera, Tommy announces that this is the autopsy on an unidentified female who will be known as Jane Doe. He introduces himself as the one performing the autopsy and Austin as his assistant. He continues that the autopsy will be conducted in four stages, an external evaluation, an internal evaluation of the heart and lungs, then the digestive organs, and then lastly, the brain. The radio announces beautiful weather as Austin starts snapping photos of the body. This is... Something that you're not really supposed to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there is that mention of beautiful weather and they make it clear that it will continue. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Austin identifies Jane Doe as in her mid to late 20s, but Tommy corrects him. She appears to be. Austin makes the adjustment and continues, identifying her as Caucasian and commenting that her skin looks normal with no outward signs of bleeding or bruising, no scarring or actually any marks at all. He remarks on her brown hair and peels her eyes open to get a look at the color when he identifies them milky and cloudy as gray. He catches Tommy's attention. The eyes are incredibly haunting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it becomes something that honestly, maybe one of the more unsettling things in the film. Yeah. As they continue to cut back. Yeah. I was very um, affected. Yeah. Tommy remarks that you don't see clouding like this unless the body has been dead for days. To check this, he lifts her arm slightly to check for lividity, but there is none. He comments on this and Austin bends her other arm easily, remarking that there's no rigor mortis either. He asks his dad when he thinks that she died and Tommy points out that she's colder than the ambient temperature and Austin wonders if the conditions at the scene played a factor. Austin notices how small Jane Doe's waist is, remarking that it doesn't fit with the rest of her frame. Tommy says it could be congenital, but they won't know until they open her up. He tells Austin to write it down on the board and that they'll check it out later. When Austin walks away, Tommy curiously inspects her hands and feet, still confused. When he holds her ankle to move the joint in her foot, he notices something moving beneath the skin. He inspects it, something loose and moving freely in response to his touch underneath her skin. He reports to Austin that her wrists and ankles are fractured. So we just got a list of things that shouldn't at all be happening. Yeah. Or here or at all. We just found this girl. Yeah. It just continues to become more and more puzzling. Yeah. And disturbing. I I think. Do we have the warrants on speed dial? <laughs> like, <'cause>, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm a little nervous right now. Like, Ed, you're really gonna want to yeah, see that. <laughs> he was very very influenced by the Conjuring. <laughs> it's just a spinoff. It's a crossover. <laughs> Austin doesn't understand how you can break your wrists and ankles without it showing outwardly at all. But Tommy kind of dismisses this, saying that simple fractures happen all the time. But Austin, investigating himself now, doesn't accept this. He says that Jane Doe's joints are shattered. Tommy begins to scrape under Jane Doe's fingernails, and Austin asks if it's dirt. After commenting that it's denser and heavier than dirt, Tommy is shocked to identify it as peat which he hasn't seen in ages. Pete did this? <laughs> <laughs> this was Pete. Yeah. <laughs> Just couldn't let him have it. <laughs> they find more underneath her toenails and even in her hair. They take samples of both, and Austin asks if maybe she was buried in Pete and wonders where you would even find it. Tommy says you could buy it from a nursery, but to naturally get it from the ground, you would have to go up north. It's not around here. 
Tommy shines a light up her nostrils, muttering that there's no inflammation, fluid, or substances. When he does the same to her ear canal, he finds the same. Nothing. Austin pulls her jaw open and recoils when it's revealed that Jane Doe's tongue has been cut off. The reveal of that tongue is shocking. Yeah. It's so it's so much. It's it's one of those visuals that kind of stays with you of her opened mouth mm-hmm. and just the look of the way that it's been. Yeah. yeah. It's uh I'm going to be thinking about that tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks great. It does. Yes, it does. It does. Tommy admits that he wasn't expecting that and he inspects it, saying that it was cut off but cut off crudely and non-surgically. Austin offers that maybe she bit it off, but Tommy says that these aren't bite marks. He points out the striations marring the end of her severed tongue. He stands straight and realizes that he saw something like this before, around 15 years ago. He goes over to the board and starts marking the areas of note on the sketch of her body. He says that it was a case of human trafficking around Norfolk. Two girls had their hands and feet bound tightly to keep them from running, and their tongues were cut out because they'd made too much noise. Austin asks if this could have to do with sex work, and Tommy only answers clinically that they can't rule it out. I, I don't know if it's just the way that my jaw is formatted. Mm-hmm. What? But <laughs> <laughs> you a robot, dude? <laughs> yes. Well, my jaw isn't been updated. <laughs> oh, my jaw was programmed. Yeah. <laughs> the operating system of my jaw currently yeah. uh i i i tried to see if i no i didn't try too hard yeah. i didn't try very you hard you could bite your tongue off yeah and what? i just i can't get my my teeth to line up right yeah. i just can't do it so just the idea of doing it yeah. set your jaw to update while you're asleep oh. and then you, yeah. and well, you I, just yeah. wake up it needs to be plugged into the charger yeah. <laughs> Make sure you're in Wi-Fi. Okay, it's very simple. I'll do that tonight. I'm and sorry. Then you can you can bite your tongue off whenever you want. You want. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you mean this? Or you've seen this before. You've seen this yeah. happen to other people before, like that. This exact same yeah. thing. When he said that, I literally wrote, "You have." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you already know what's gonna happen. Yeah. Now. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we can get out of here and go catch that movie. Yeah, because yeah. I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> Case closed. Yeah. Austin leans over Jane Doe to take a photo of the remains of her tongue, but he notices her left nostril, which had been cleared as empty only moments ago, began to move. He peers at it as blood begins to run out, making a macabre red carpet for the fly that pulls itself from her nostril and buzzes away. So just even though we've been doing this for a long time, this is a family job, you know what I mean? Where, how long before you see the nostril move in yeah. the blood? Are you just gonna be like, Dad, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to do this no more. I don't know what's happening here. You've seen this before. Please explain I was that. Say, yeah. yeah, what the hell is this? Tommy's like, I've seen it all. I've seen yeah. this before. It's, yeah, it's the, the fact fly buzzes that, out then ends yeah. it all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is the fact that he just checked it. Yeah, just a couple seconds ago. I feel like it's easy to just to be like, oh, okay, I guess when somebody's like, no, that happens. No, that's rare, but it happens. No, I've seen this before a long time ago. No, that's a thing that happens sometimes. It's like. Uh, well, in all fairness, I mean, the fly really does not get a reaction. No. Yeah. So maybe this is normal. Yeah. Maybe we all have flies in us. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> just waiting. Yeah. Can't bite our tongues. Got flies in us. Yeah. <laughs> just that's you. just me. <laughs> okay. Well, you know. <laughs> But the fly goes into the bug zapper and is zapped. The Tildens get back to work. Tommy finds a missing bottom left molar in Jane Doe's mouth and tasks Austin with making impressions of her teeth. Tommy reaches a small hooked instrument into her mouth and there's a moment of suspense until he slowly pulls it out to reveal a long white thread. Austin identifies it as a fabric when he looks at it under a microscope. Tommy tells him to bag it and send it to the lab. Austin does as he's told as thunder begins to rumble loudly outside. So already. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy begins a pelvic exam on Jane Doe, remarking that there's no external seminal fluid. He calls to Austin to bring him a swab, and Austin does, standing by uncomfortably as Tommy swabs between Jane Doe's legs. The resulting swab is stained with blood, and it is closed and contained. 
Austin sits as Tommy continues his exam, stating that Jane Doe is torn up inside, mentioning ridges and grooves in the tissue. Austin asks if there are abrasions, and Tommy is somber and serious when he looks up at his son to tell him that he's wrong. They're deliberate cuts. Jane Doe stares up at the ceiling, cloudy eyes wide, nose bloodied, and mouth open to reveal her severed tongue. The thunder continues. Austin compares the evidence they've gathered against the trafficking theory. Severed tongue, shattered joints, and vaginal trauma would fit. Tommy pulls off his gloves and discards them in the trash, reminding his son that they've still got a ways to go. He leaves the room and Austin glances up at the clock. 9.45. This mystery, granted, it's it's one that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. It's our assignment. We've been tasked with it. But at the same time, I fear the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you shouldn't have told her 11, Chief. Yeah, you yeah. shouldn't have done that, Chief. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, who the fuck is expecting this? Yeah. That, well, yeah. but you had to have known. I mean, you know it was that, well, Even he said it was something weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to... This is... And Dad seems pretty thorough. He's not going to let you half-ass this. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, say something, though. Like, look, stuff's getting weird here. I'm probably not going to make it. I'd be like, Dad, you got me about for another 75 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, Emma? What? I'm coming. <laughs> Later, Tommy continues speaking to the camera. With only the external examination finished, they're moving on to the internal, starting with the heart and lungs. Working together, they lift Jane Doe's upper body enough to slide a block underneath her. Just as Tommy brings a blade close to Jane Doe's chest, the radio crackles with life. It is utter distortion, underlined with a few stray sounds of screaming, before a song finally comes in clear. Open up your heart and let the sunshine in. The two smirk and Austin goes to change the station, replacing the lyric, It's all about the devil with bluesy rock. You didn't really, both of you motherfuckers, <laughs> hear that scary shit on the radio and then like, bitch, change that back. Change it. <laughs> what the fuck was that? We're listening to classic rock. What happened? To yeah. <laughs> That's all they get from that moment? The, yeah. yeah. I, Dude, the screaming that we hear. Yeah. yeah. And the song, they're basically, this lady really hates the devil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she's got a personal vendetta against the devil. And I feel like this vendetta? needs to be. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this needs to be explored is all I'm trying yeah. to say. <laughs> they kind of like look at each other and smile. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, yeah, I'd be like, oh, we got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. They're yeah. like Southern living, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, dude. And I also, I will say, I I appreciate whenever films make songs that are somewhat innocuous. Yeah. Terrifying. Mm -hmm. But I don't, especially with what we learn about Jane Doe, I want to know how old this song is. Oh, okay. that's a that's an interesting point. Because yeah. I think that would be very fascinating to know. Yeah. Because I know that this is not like this isn't like a hit from the fifties. Right? <laughs> 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 that they've just slowed down for the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Tommy glides the scalpel down Jane Doe's chest, creating a Y incision. I did want to stop here to kind of talk about Owen, Catherine, Kelly, and this whole situation with her being Jane Doe. Yes. Um. Just an interesting fact, Andre Overdahl did say that she was the first person that they talked to to play this part, mm -hmm. and he knew instantly that it was meant to be her, mm -hmm. but they continued like interviewing other actors and um, obviously went back to her. But Brian Cox said on a panel that I watched that there were moments where he would break and, and be afraid that she was actually not breathing, because they said that 80% of when we see her, it's actually her, not Damn. a dummy. Even when they do the Y incision, it's her underneath a thin prosthetic that he's cutting. But they said that she was like a master of yoga and she trained herself to do really shallow breathing. And so she's breathing, I mean, I guess fine yeah. this entire time, but you, it's not visibly perceptible. And so Brian Cox would be horrified that she had stopped breathing mm -hmm. and she'd be like, I'm fine. They said that she really wouldn't interact with them a lot because she wanted to keep that like mystery. And I, it just her performance is 
staggering when you realize that that is i mean that's really her laying there yeah and in a lot of the interviews i read overdahl kept saying that she obviously had the hardest job yes. oh yeah he said that for weeks for 10 hour days she would oh, lie on this slab and so very rarely as you had said because they did do a little bit of cg and digital enhancements mm-hmm. but it was really minimal Okay. And whenever they did do it, they said that they would layer her body on top of these digital enhancements and prosthetics. And so it is her all the time. Yeah. yeah. Even if it is that slight uh, integration. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I did want to talk about the autopsy that we're about to witness. Uh Mm Uh-huh. Because they had said that what they wanted, at least Overdahl in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, he had said that he wanted it to be clinical. He wanted it to be beautiful Mm -hmm. and he didn't want it to be gory or gratuitous yeah and i feel like he accomplished all of those things yeah Mm -hmm. they talked to two makeup artists in den of geek it was bella Cruikshank and Gemma harwood and what they had said was that they went through a ton of research of accidents and victims of them okay and so they were trying to determine the best way to display these injuries on a real person yeah it wasn't about trying to gross you out or freak you out yeah it was trying to do it accurately okay and as you had said in your intro about these technical advisors Mm -hmm. these actual morgue workers they did what you would expect them to do as far as making sure that these scenes are accurate and the order of doing things But another thing that they did was they worked with the actress playing Jane Doe to tell her that when you move a corpse like this, this is what their face does. Oh. This is what their mouth does. And so there's accuracy in the portrayal of a corpse. Yeah. Very nice. So it's it's very, very thorough. That's incredible. I just, she just deserves all the flowers for oh, this. Oh, yeah. Very much. I mean, and they had said that they the room was heated, but she's on marble mm. and it's freezing. They said the only thing that she's wearing is the pubic wig. And they actually nicknamed it Mary for some reason. All right. (laughs) But (laughs) they had said that actually that wig was a lot of research as well and a point of contention between producers of how much it should be. I don't know. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They said, and it was a matter of history, which we'll get to. Mm, Okay, okay, okay. okay. To say what was likely at that time. Yeah. Well, I can guess what was. (laughs) Yeah, no (laughs) shit. Whatever, okay. (laughs) I don't think there was a choice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Really, but. But all right. (laughs) But um, to their credit, they had said, uh, Overdahl said that one of the the morgue workers that they had, they kept talking about him. His name was Stuart. Mm -hmm. That (laughs) they talked about, he would just tell them stories on set about um, that he, oh, well, I saw one time this happened to this person. Yeah, they ended up in our uh, on our table. Like, I mean, it was just like nothing. <laughs> and uh, when they would ask him, like, what he liked to do and what hobbies he had, he was like, oh, no, nothing. <laughs> but he said that he shook his hand at the end of everything and was like, I'm so proud to have been a part of this because oh, wow. of the accuracy. So, I mean, that's got to feel that's got to feel good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that also plays into helping us better to believe this. Yeah. Because I feel like if it's very sloppy or it looks very like there was no uh, study taken into it, you could tell and then it would feel just very generic. Yes. Do you guys even really know what you're doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, okay. I guess they're, you know what I mean? They know what they're doing. But to see that and to hear that, Mm -hmm. it does lend because it does. It. I think that that's what makes it scarier because it is believable. They do know what they're talking about. And then you looking it up and seeing that, it's like, oh, shit. So they weren't just saying medical shit that they they're actually saying exactly what's going on Mm -hmm. and it's realistic yeah it's not just blood and guts and you know yeah so they would know well it's it's like we talked about with saw three yeah yeah yeah. with the surgery scene and we were like oh well holy shit yeah (laughs) (laughs) but as soon as tommy is finished with the y incision blood begins to pour out of jane doe's body through the cut pulling into a drain underneath her austin is like they're not supposed to bleed like that right But Tommy assures him that he's seen this. (laughs) (laughs) 
I th- I think that's the point where the eerie score kicked in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I was alluding to earlier. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very vaguely. But it is. It's the same thing that he's doing about the look before you leap thing. Yeah. yeah. Again, he's like, don't say this is weird yet. Yeah. Even though it's very weird. It is. Yeah. It is very weird because he's saying he's seen it, but it's like not in this circumstance. Yes. So this is weird right now that this is happening. For it all to for it all to be here. Yeah. That it's this hasn't happened before. Yeah. Every single aspect that you've seen, it's been a strange and weird case that stuck out to you. Mm-hmm. But all of this is happening to her. Mm-hmm. So it's like What are the a odds? Lot. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot. He says that it's caused by a buildup of pressure, but it's only on fresh corpses that have only been dead an hour or two. As Tommy pulls her chest cavity open, Austin collects some of the blood in a container and stores it in the fridge. When there is a dark substance visible in her exposed muscle, Austin asks what it is. Tommy guesses that it could be melanoma, but tells Austin to collect it and they'll see what the lab has to say. Austin does. It's not our old friend Pete. It's not Pete. (laughs) (laughs) He turns to walk the vial over to the fridge, but he stops in his tracks. Tommy asks Austin to get him the rib cutters, but Austin is still staring silently at the fridge. The door is ajar and a pool of blood is on the floor beneath it. Tommy snaps at him. Today? Yeah. <laughs> Say something. He's your dad. Yeah. Hey, hold dad, on. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Tommy approaches the fridge silently and pulls the door open to reveal that all of the biohazard jars and vials are covered in streaks of blood. They've all been dripped on by Jane Doe's blood on the top shelf, which is leaking from its vial. Tommy notices what's going on as Austin removes a bag from the shelf and grabs a towel to clean up the bloody mess. He asks his son what he did and tells him that he needs to focus. (laughs) I, I didn't, didn't do, do fucking, fucking shit, shit. Yeah. dude. Seriously? Yeah. I've been with you this whole I've been time. With you. Not only that, look at the amount of blood that's there from that little vial. Yeah, no. That's true. No, you. Th- it makes no sense. You know there's something wrong here. <laughs> this is just not making this. We need to get out of here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dad, leave your body. Yeah. Let's run. <laughs> But Austin just tells him that he's got it and Tommy returns back to the body. He tells Austin that he was right. Jane Doe's waist doesn't fit her frame and it's not congenital either. When Austin asks what could have caused it, Tommy says that a corset could have if she wore one long enough. Austin asks, didn't that go out of style a couple hundred years ago? You can still find them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) But Tommy doesn't answer. Instead, he gets the rib cutters himself and begins cutting her ribs. The bones crack loudly as Tommy works until he pulls a piece of the ribs out. I want to say they don't show the ribs actually being broken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that sound is on. Yeah. The sound is like it is unsettling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it makes you your skin kind of crawl. Yeah. Austin joins his father as Tommy peers inside the cavity. He comments that the lungs are severely black. We see this to be true, and Austin remarks that he didn't take her for a smoker, which (laughs) there's no evidence to. No. (laughs) She doesn't seem like she smoked. It's like, what? You never knew her. Jane, I thought you were cool. Tommy, removing a piece of the lungs for Austin to collect in a container, says that Jane Doe could have smoked 10 packs a day for 30 years and it wouldn't explain this. I do like too. it's really subtle, but I feel like it really conveys how practiced they are and how often they do this and how often they work together that Tommy will just cut something out and Austin will just be standing there ready to collect it. Mm -hmm. Like there's no like get this or get that. Like they know they've done this so many times. They know the routine. We know we need to take a piece of the lungs. We know, you know, it. that was really um, just like a quiet, quiet character moments, I guess that I appreciated. Mm hmm. But Austin asks if that's what killed her, and Tommy is confused. With her lungs damaged like this, she should be covered in third-degree burns. He equates it to finding a brain with a bullet in it, but without a gunshot wound. Tommy pulls out her heart and points out the marks on it. He says it's almost like it's been cut. We see this, and that's exactly what it looks like. While Tommy's inspecting the heart, Austin comments on similar markings on the organs still inside. Tommy says that they look like scar tissue. 
He tells Austin to imagine all of this internal trauma reflected externally, the shattered ankles and wrists, fire burned lungs and scarred organs. He asks his son what she would look like. Austin says that she would be mangled and disfigured beyond recognition, but she's not. He asks, how the hell do you even do this? The thunder rumbles loudly again and the lights begin to flicker overhead. Tommy says that if you want to kill someone, there are a million easy ways, shooting them, poisoning them or drowning them. You don't go to these lengths unless you really want them to suffer. We close in on Jane Doe's staring face, but the moment of tension and mounting music is cut short when a door slams in the hallway. Austin says that he'll take care of it. You, I mean, you don't go through those links because this is fucking horrible. Yeah. And a lot of it is impossible. That's what I'm so how confused. How do you cut her heart? How like, do you, well, how do you cut her heart without any external trauma? Yeah. yeah. And her ribs are just fine. They were. Well, yeah. <laughs> they, <laughs> they they're, they're wide open now, but I don't, I, I feel like that is the practical side of Tommy. Mm-hmm. He's still trying to find a solution for everything, but sometimes the the solution is it's evil. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. Sometimes that is the answer. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's some kind of spirit, or yeah. <laughs> it's e for evil. <laughs> it does make me think, though. He was talking about being burned. What would they look like? Well, we just seen Howard. Yeah, yeah. like that. Like that. Yeah. And so, and he, where did we find him? In a fire. And where we find her? In the foundation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Austin heads out, peering into rooms as he walks down the empty hall. Meanwhile, Tommy begins to look over the crime scene photos of the other victims, all bloodied. While looking at a picture of Jane Doe's unearthed body, he comments that she's so clean. In the hallway, Austin peers through the kitchen area to find it empty. He pokes his head into another door, but when he brings it back out into the hallway, to his horror, he sees a figure standing boldly reflected in that dome mirror in the corner of the ceiling. Confusion etched into his face. He quietly and slowly rounds the corner to find nothing. So again, I love these little moments of kind of quiet horror. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the payoff of that mirror. Yes. Yeah. And the payoff of all the discussions they've had about her waist. Yeah. yeah. Because if you looked at that silhouette, that was Jane Doe. Yeah. Oh. Thunder rumbles again loudly as Tommy looks down on Jane Doe in the autopsy room. Before bringing a scalpel back down to her chest, Tommy ponders, what happened to you? In the hallway, Austin hears a clanging sound. He pushes a door, and as it creaks open on its hinges, a completely dark room is revealed. Meanwhile, Tommy continues working his scalpel into Jane Doe's chest, but he has to stop when a sharp stump of her ribs cut the inside of his wrist. I, oddly, I, I felt that. that was, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why, but I just feel like I think it's starting to get to him in a way that he's losing his focus. Yeah. yeah. Because he, that would never happen. No. Yeah. And so. Not as careful and like strategic as we already know him to be. Mm-hmm. No. And we know, especially through conversations later, that he internalizes a lot. Yes. Yeah. And so he's probably freaking the fuck out, but he's but trying, trying to, to be cool. Yeah. yeah. Austin, though, makes his way into the dark room and turns on a lamp. As Tommy washes his hand in the sink of the autopsy room, something visibly moves within the grates of the vent. Air conditioning begins to blow in the room that Austin is in, and he climbs on a chair to inspect the vent. He pulls the grate off and stares into the blackness behind it. When he doesn't see anything, he turns his head to see if he can hear anything. There is a sound of movement, but when Austin turns back around to see it, something runs by quickly. This scares the shit out of him, and he falls off of his chair, crashing to the ground hard on his back. When he sits back up, there's a figure standing in the doorway. But when the figure switches on the light and comes into the room asking what the hell happened, it's Tommy. I loved this moment. Yeah. Because we're already primed to be so afraid of silhouettes. Yeah. Yes. Now, granted, Tommy didn't need to stand there like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I feel like he, he's just cleaning up the blood earlier and Tommy's like, what the hell did you do? <laughs> and then now he's crashed on the floor and he's like, what the hell? <laughs> it's like, this is just embarrassing at this Maybe point. Maybe you're not fit to take over yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I wondered why, because when he walks in the room, he doesn't even hit the light. The light switch was right there. He doesn't. Yeah. He goes for the lamp. It's like, dude, hold on. There's light right there. There's less scary light right yeah. there. <laughs> I will say I do love the building of suspense, too, because we don't see what Austin saw. Yeah. Yeah. And so we kind of live in that moment of just confusion. Yeah. When asked if he's okay, Austin says that there's something in the vent. They pick everything up and Austin climbs back up on the chair. But this time, when he shines a flashlight inside, Stanley is staring back at him, lying on his side. Immediately concerned, Austin pulls him out. Stanley is whimpering and dying, the side of his body wounded and bloody. Wordlessly and sadly, Austin passes the cat to his father, and after solemnly cradling him for a moment, Tommy gives Stanley the mercy of ending his life. This is the worst moment of my life. Yeah. Yeah, this was pretty hard. I was uh, devastated. It was like the Vader meme of just, no. (laughs) I was so upset. We watch through the dome mirror as they transport Stanley, wrapped up in a blanket like a baby, into the cremation room. Austin watches as Tommy loads the cat into the incinerator and switches it on. Sad piano plays as the incinerator begins to burn. Looking at the flame through the window, Tommy asks his son to give him a minute. I needed a minute. I did too. (laughs) I I did too. I took a break. Yeah. Austin obliges, stepping out into the hallway. He nervously glances at the mirror, but there is nothing and no one there. Back in the autopsy room, bloody instruments sit in a bowl to be cleaned and a fly rests on Jane Doe's eyeball. Austin stands, lost in his own thoughts, until one of the freezer drawers creaks open on its own. He is startled and goes to close it, but as soon as he touches it, Tommy appears, asking him what he's doing. (laughs) 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 Tommy keeps catching him and like embarrassing him or weird (laughs) shit like back to back to back. Austin assumes that he must not have closed the drawer all the way. Tommy makes his way to the sink and washes his hands. The two stand in silence for a moment before Tommy admits that Stanley was a pain in the ass, but he belonged to Austin's mother, and that's one of the few things of her that he had left. Austin nods in understanding, and when he opens up that he misses her too, Tommy insists that they just keep going. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. So again, just deflection of feelings that they're both feeling Mm -hmm. that they could you know bond or talk out or whatever and tommy's just like no it shut it off internalize yeah yeah thunder rumbles as tommy announces stage three of the autopsy of jane doe they're starting with the stomach and gastrointestinal system he leans into jane doe's body but austin interrupts telling him that he can talk to him Tommy insists that he's not keeping anything, but Austin tells him that he puts up an act for people. Tommy says again that he is fine and Austin has no choice but to accept it. Effectively ending the conversation, Tommy slices open Jane Doe's stomach and pulls out something long and dark. Austin asks if it's a flower, but Tommy doesn't answer. Instead, he rushes to his books to look it up. It's Jimson Weed. He tells Austin that it's a paralyzing agent. That would explain the inflammation in her organs. He rushes off to the chalkboard as Austin skims over the aliases of the plant, including Moonflower. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I read there's another alias. They call it the Devil's Snare. Huh. Oh, that sounds badass. It does. I only have ever heard of this before because of an episode of CSI. (laughs) Back to... Just throwing that out there. Was it Grissom again? (laughs) Greg, Greg uh, identified it, but anyway. Oh, well, you know, (laughs) everybody gets one. (laughs) Jotting down his finds, Tommy says that this proves that Jane Doe is from up north. Austin asks how she ended up here then, and Tommy reminds him that it's just one thing at a time. He's just trying to make sense of all of this. I'm sorry, but at this point, just from thinking of history, Mm -hmm. the first time I ever watched this film, I started to connect some dots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was very worrisome. Yeah. When we talk about Jimson Weed and the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. And things. Things. (laughs) That unfortunately (laughs) happened. It was interesting to me because I expected Tommy to be like, that's not our job. That's not our business to wonder how she got here. But he was like, look, I'm trying to figure this out. Like, yeah. He's shifting. 
Yeah. He's like, let's leap and then look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always leap first. What do you say, son? <laughs> <laughs> Aim for the bushes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always. <laughs> The thunder continues and the radio comes back to life, warning with the weather report that wind gusts are being reported at 60 miles per hour and rain is expected to be at three inches within the hour. Looking a little creeped out, Austin suggests to his father that they just finish this in the morning. Tommy says that Burke needs the cause of death tonight, though, and they're not even close to knowing what that is. He tells his son firmly that when they start something, they need to finish it. He tells him that if he wants to leave, leave. Austin puts on another pair of gloves. Tommy returns to the body, pulling something else out of her stomach. The something is wrapped in a cloth. They open it up, Austin pulling out what looks to be a tooth and dropping it into an evidence tray as Tommy unfurls the cloth to reveal a symbol. Tommy lays it out on a light to get a better look, and Austin comments that it looks like a shroud. Tommy agrees, adding that it looks old. Seeing that, That's I'm it. sorry, mm-hmm. Bert, dude. I we did what I I'm getting the fuck. That is so scary. Yeah, that is so fucking scary. How are we able to unroll this? Yeah, is that a glyph I see in the middle? Yeah. Of this? <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so many like there's no reason to continue with any of this. Now I will say that I'm very intrigued by this mystery. Yeah. yeah, and I could see very easily being caught up with this mystery. Oh yeah, but we can be caught up with this mystery at the Strand. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, movie night. Anyway. That was wild, right? <laughs> Austin is confused, saying that stomach acid should have dissolved this. It's amazing that it's intact still. And I was thinking the same thing. Yes. yes. It, it's co- it's fine. Yes. Yeah. This is it's not amazing. It's 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 magic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's impossible. Yes. He points out a set of Roman numerals and then copies them onto the chalkboard. A light bulb going off over his head. He rushes to the thread that they pulled from Jane Doe's mouth, unbags it and puts it under the microscope again. Tommy is still inspecting the cloth, saying that there is a T and an S that don't fit in with the Roman numerals. Austin snatches the cloth away and puts it under the microscope. Tommy asks what he's doing, but he's too focused to answer. He picks up the tray containing the tooth and aligns it in the gap in Jane Doe's mouth. It's a perfect fit. So we're getting ideas now. We're figuring it out. We're yeah. putting more pieces together. Yeah. Yeah, this glyph ridden cloth yeah <laughs> it held her own tooth yeah <laughs> that was fed to her <laughs> case closed yeah <laughs> all right that's how she died she took yeah, her that's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to the strand <laughs> large popcorn there's three yeah. of us <laughs> free refills <laughs> Austin gives his summary to his father. Someone pulled out her tooth, wrapped it in cloth, and forced her to swallow it. Tommy asks about the drawing, but Austin guesses it to be religious or ritualistic. Tommy smooths the cloth back over the light and offers that they play that out. Every ritual has a purpose. He asks Austin about what MO they have so far, and his son recaps. First they bound her, then they ripped out her tongue, they poisoned her, paralyzed her forced her to swallow the cloth as he speaks we're shown the physical evidence that supports every aspect of this theory he says then the cuts internal mutilation stabs and if that wasn't enough they burned her thunder rumbles as austin looks at the chalk depiction of jane doe commenting that it's almost like a human sacrifice Almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel we can, yeah. <laughs> we can kind of put a bow on that. Yeah, put that on the form. Yeah. <laughs> Jane Doe's milky eyes stare endlessly upward as the radio warns of a flash flood. Tommy says that you can't just kill someone this way without any traces on the outside. He says that she doesn't even have a broken fingernail. Austin says that if they could just find out why, but Tommy interrupts him. Down here, if you can't touch it or see it, it doesn't matter. Austin reminds his father that bodies aren't just causes of death, and this happened to her for a reason. The radio cautions that this is not a storm anyone wants to be caught in. He tells people that if they're home, stay home. Bizarrely, the radio crackles and he ends with, One thing's for sure, you're not going anywhere. The radio has been threatening me. The toaster has been laughing at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is wild. Can we leave now? Like, that's not enough. That's yeah. a lot. 
That's like some 1408 shit. Did it? Yeah. <laughs> this disturbs Austin. And when he turns to the radio, it crackles again. And again, open up your heart begins to play. If I'm Austin, I'm like, Dad, there's no way someone's been requesting this song. I'm yeah. Like, it's good, but it's not that good. We got to get out of here. And every time we turn it on or the TV, the radio turns on its own, it's yeah. on that part. Yes. Yes. It's always on that part. They really want us to know they hate the devil, yeah. dude. Can we leave? <laughs> Please? Dude, I'll buy you a ticket. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't even worry you about that. You have to worry that. about it. I have a free one every month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Austin doesn't go to turn it off this time. Instead, he looks around, listening to the sound of the music mingling with the sound of the storm. Gently, he suggests to his father, who is already back to work on Jane Doe, that maybe they should get out of here. But Tommy, who has begun filleting Jane Doe's skin from her muscle, only tells his son to help him with this. Austin does, and they pull Jane Doe's skin back to reveal the markings from the cloth on the inside of her skin. I think we fucked up. Oh, yeah. Uh, we got ourselves into something we ain't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fucking <laughs> out of. <laughs> we need to leave right now. Yeah. This is like a point of no return. Yeah. Warren. This is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is, this is just the visual of this is so fucking scary to me. Mm -hmm. It's because, and it's, it's putting it in your head. You have to imagine how this is even possible. Yeah. Yes. And just the pure, just the unveiling. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's brilliant. Austin remarks with the horrified, holy shit. Tommy just stares in disbelief as the music continues to play. The drawer to the freezer begins to creak open again, and Austin and Tommy both turn in that direction. But suddenly, the bright overhead lights of the autopsy room explode, raining glass down on them. I was not expecting that. No. <laughs> <laughs> The radio shuts up and the Tildens are left in complete darkness and silence. Austin is able to use the flashlight on his phone and shines it across the room, calling out to his father in fear. But Tommy doesn't answer. You mean to tell me you've had this phone this whole time and you haven't called for help? You haven't called yeah. your girlfriend to be like, look, there's some weird shit going on here. Please don't come back over here. Or yeah, but I, when you have your dad in your ear and he's like, I've seen, yeah. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen Cliff okay. kill clocks and people all the time. <laughs> then text your girlfriends like my dad saying he's seen some really weird shit. I'm mm -hmm. scared. I, uh, <laughs> I'm frightened. I thought that he had a flashlight. Yeah. And then when I see him, I was like, oh, he's using a phone. Yeah. I think it, like you were saying at the beginning, it speaks to like kind of the timelessness of this because yeah. I was kind of shocked to see a cell phone. Yeah. Because everything we've seen so far, it really doesn't lend to any kind of yeah. period. Yeah. The beam of the light finds the freezer drawers, which all stand wide open and empty. Mm hmm. This is a great concern to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to get a little worried. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> Austin finally finds his father with the light. Tommy stands gaping at the open and empty drawers. And when he sees his son, he says what we're all thinking. Let's get the fuck out of here. I was very happy to hear that. Yes. yes. The light blinks as Austin shines it around the room, revealing Jane Doe to be exactly where she was still on the slab. Austin follows his father down a dark hallway, but when the generator kicks on, they're blessed with a weak light from the bulbs above them. Tommy tries to call the elevator, but Austin points out that there's not enough power. They continue forward, only to pause when they hear a loud crash. They rush upstairs to the cellar doors that Tommy had come out of earlier, but something is holding them shut. Tommy yells at Austin, who is distracted looking down at the stairs to help him. I feel like we kind of get a stair hole shot. Yeah. Yeah. Down the creepiest set of stairs I've yeah. ever seen. <laughs> Austin does help and they're able to push the doors open enough to see that outside the rain is pouring and the old sycamore that once stood has crashed onto the doors. I feel like the, the line delivery from Brian Cox there is just... It just shows how brilliant of an actor he is. Yeah. He put intensity in like... Emo there's so much emotion in the line about the sycamore tree yeah, yeah. <laughs> as i was watching i was like god damn yeah, dude <laughs> fucking tree yeah i was like yeah. you are so good it's, it's unbelievable 
Austin holds his phone up, trying to get a signal, but there is none. Tommy has the idea to try the landline in the office. They creep down the hallway, silent and careful, as the storm continues to rage outside. Tommy stops his son when they hear a thumping sound further down the hall. They stop and listen for a moment before making a mad dash into the office. Once inside, Austin asks what the hell that was, and Tommy quickly answers that he doesn't know before trying the phone. When there's a dial tone, he thanks God. He calls the police station and identifies himself, saying that he needs help. When the officer on the other end says that he's having trouble hearing Tommy, Tommy tells him to put Burke on the line. When Burke answers, Tommy tells him that he needs to get here now. Burke says that he can barely hear him, and Tommy pleads with him that they're trapped down here. Before Burke can offer a clear reply, the line is disconnected. <laughs> Defeated, Tommy hangs up the phone, and the Tildens sit in a new silence until that silence is broken by the ringing of a bell. I thought it was going to be broken by him saying, well, we're going to die down here. Son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hope you're prepared. Hope you <laughs> I <know>. made peace. <laughs> I hope there's a change of pants because oh. that would have scared the <laughs> fuck out of yes. me. Dude, I don't even know how like this is this is our way out. Yeah. And to have that taken away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then to hear this bell, which I know more than anyone what it means. Yes. Yeah. I've seen the nun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Tilden. Yeah. <laughs> But the sound is coming from the other side of the door. Austin starts to approach it slowly. Tommy rises to his feet as Austin lowers himself to peek underneath the door. There is nothing there in the hallway. But suddenly, the bell sounds again, accompanied by a toad-tagged foot that it's attached to. It's crazy how we just live in this office now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forever and ever until. That's weird, right? <laughs> Austin jumps back up and stares at the slit in the door. The shadows of two feet step into view and the owner of the feet starts to bang on the door. Tommy and Austin snap into action, grabbing a file cabinet and sliding it in front of the door. The knocking and banging on the other side continues until it abruptly stops. Austin tells Tommy that it's her. Everything was fine until Burke brought her here. Tommy tries to reason with him, but Austin continues until we cut into her. Tommy reasons to Austin's logic, reminding him that he's talking about a corpse. Suddenly remembering the cut across his wrist made by Jane Doe's ribs, Tommy rushes to the bathroom. Austin continues, bringing up the things they found inside of her, the marks and the injuries. He tells his father that he can't say she's just a body. Tommy holds his wrist, which is now caked in dried blood, under the running faucet. The shower curtain starts to flutter in the breeze and catches his attention. He shuts off the water. Austin, sitting in the office, says that they should have left. He wanted to leave. You can't do yeah, that. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Now we're dividing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This is the thing. Yeah. Hey, and the autopsy trying to figure out the... True. Oh, True. yeah. I mean... <laughs> Tommy walks over to the curtain. Austin sees this and worriedly calls out to him just as Tommy rips the curtain open. But there's nothing there. Austin breathes a sigh of relief, but suddenly Tommy is yanked backward in the dark bathroom, away from the shower, and the door slams shut. This is what I think uh, you guys were probably referring to when we talked about kind of like the cheapy scares. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. This one I'm actually fine with. I like the sight of the silhouette. It, I did. I have to admit, it did make me laugh when he's like, "Dad, no!" Yeah, oh, I guess it's like, okay. <laughs> and then he's like, "Ah!" Yeah. And then he does end up getting his ass kicked anyway. So <laughs> he does. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I was gonna say that I kind of get. I give it a pass because it was a subversion. Because you think that it's coming from the shower. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like surprise, bitch, from behind. You <laughs> yeah, know? I agree. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was ready to defend it, but I didn't need to. So. <laughs> <laughs> calm, calm down. Yeah. Okay. Let me chill out. Let me chill out. <laughs> Switch gears. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing that we all agree. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Austin tries to break the door down, but with every bash of the door, Tommy is similarly thrown around the bathroom, finally ending up on the floor. The door unlocks on its own and Austin crashes into the room. 
He finds his father alone, groaning in pain on the bathroom floor. When there is a loud crash in the office, Austin looks inside to find that the large cabinet has been thrown onto its side and the door to the office is slowly creaking open. He tends to his father, slowly raising his shirt to find bruises on his stomach and side. Austin checks these injuries and Tommy remarks that her eyes were gray. They had her eyes. I will say there is a very quick cut. Mm -hmm. And you do see just it's it's just blackness, like just wrinkled skin. Yeah. And then this piercing milky eye. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a split. But it it looks great. Yes. We're we're talking over each other. We're we're so impressed. Yeah. (laughs) But but yeah, here. So, yeah, no, there is no problems here. Yeah. Yeah. We're all on the same page. Yeah. Austin says that this is what he's been trying to tell him. It's her. Tommy still maintains that it's not possible, but Austin counters that her body and the things they found inside of it aren't possible. Whatever is happening here is way past possible. He repeats, it's her. Tommy asks, what do we do? Austin and Tommy step out into the hallway and find a bloody cloth on the ground. Austin picks it up for a moment before dropping it back to the floor, horrified. They make their way back to the autopsy room. Ed and Lorraine, I'm just saying. <laughs> let's, let's, let's Once again. Yeah. <laughs> they, they will know what to do. Yes. They'll help. And Ed's just painting the scariest corpse. Yeah. <laughs> You've ever seen it? Like, I don't know how to start painting yeah. this this morning. <laughs> That's weird, right? This is strange. I think we got to go to Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the autopsy room, it is still very dark, even with the low glow of the lights above. The freezer drawers remain empty, and Jane Doe still lies still on the metal slab, her eyes staring upward and her mouth open. I don't know why I didn't expect to see her there still. (laughs) You know what? I did. When we came back, I was surprised, too. I was like, oh, she is still there. Yeah, I was even surprised when right before they left the room, when he turns and she's still laying there. Yeah. When the drawers were empty, I thought she was going to be gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at no point, I think, in it, but it makes it more terrifying. Yeah. yeah. That all this stuff is going on. You're like, she's still there. Yeah. yeah. Tommy stares at her before grabbing up a flashlight and shining it on the bowls of the organs they removed. He remarks, rapid decomp. Her removed organs are black and rotted, but the ones still inside of her aren't. Austin says that it's almost like her body is preserving them. This is enough for Tommy, who insists that they need to get her to the crematorium. As he starts to close up her body and Austin wheels a gurney over, the door to the autopsy room closes and locks on its own. Austin notices this, and when he's not able to open it, he grabs the emergency axe and starts hacking away. Through the new hole in the door, Austin peers out into the hallway. Take a shot. Take a shot. Yeah, yeah. obviously. After an agonizing moment of suspense, gray, dead flesh marred with thick black thread appears in the hole. Okay, so I want to say a couple things here. Mm-hmm. One, love the blue and red hues yeah. mm-hmm. in the light. It looks very, very cool, and it cuts through the darkness very well. Mm-hmm. But this jump scare. You don't like it? I don't like it. You you know, ghost house pictures, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sam Raimi and Rob Tappert, they have a vanity plate that plays at the beginning of the film where the skeleton shuts the door and he's looking at yeah. you through the keyhole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I did it. I shut the door. That, that's what, that was this. Yeah. I, I'll be honest. I kind of, it almost felt like you, like you knew it was coming. The, yes. The, the hole was cut intentionally just for that jump scare yeah it was it's like oh we're lingering way too long here the motion of it was too fast yeah as well i you know what i would have liked i would have liked a creeping like silent hill kind of a feel where you just see a figure in the distance and it gets closer that's, okay. yeah maybe that's, that fits more with what we've been doing i think yeah for me it's just uh i feel like for what this is yeah austin's reaction is not big enough no, no. <laughs> hell no he just, like, backs up. he's like oh it's that lady from the drawer god <laughs> damn it and are we not allowed to ask them why they're unhappy with their stay it's like, yeah. you guys are up and mad what? yeah we did everything yeah. for you we figured out what happened we <laughs> <laughs> 
But Austin backs away and Tommy approaches, looking out into the dead face on the other side of the door. It opens its mouth wide, pulling the thread, sewing it shut as it screams. Austin has had enough saying fuck it before grabbing up a bottle of chemicals. He douses Jane Doe's body and without even a word passed between them, Tommy takes out a book of matches. He lights the match and tosses it onto the body. Flames flare immediately engulfing her, but the fire spreads rapidly, jumping up onto the ceiling, burning the camera and the chalkboard. The entire ceiling is on fire and it's spreading rapidly to the rest of the room. Austin grabs the fire extinguisher, but when he can't get it going fast enough, Tommy takes it and starts to put out the flames. Austin looks over at Jane Doe, whose head remains flaming, but her body is put out and looks as if the fire never touched it. Uh, <laughs> we're terribly sorry, miss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what came over. Dude, yeah, we didn't mean anything by it. I swear to God. <laughs> If you let us go, anything, anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you all the gems and weed. You, better. <laughs> so you want a new tooth? You got it. <laughs> you got it. You got it. I know a dentist. I dropped spam. <laughs> Did the fire go out because you put the fire in the room? I don't, I don't know. Because it seemed like as Tommy was putting the fire out, she was also, the fire on her was going it out. It was slowly yeah. extinguishing. Yeah. What I think is it's almost like a connection where she's like, if you're going to do this, then everything goes up. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And then they put it out and she's like, then I also. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. And I do want to say the thing with the thread, with the opening and stuff, uh -huh. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that was good. We'll keep that visual. Just lose the, <laughs> the ghost house pictures. Yeah. Jump scare. <laughs> <laughs> By the time Tommy extinguishes the rest of the flames, the fire on Jane Doe's face quietly goes out. Tommy and Austin just stare at her, the moment broken only when they hear the elevator rumble down the hall. Austin grabs the axe and the door is easily open now. The lights in the hallway flicker on and off, but when they hear the elevator ding, they run to catch it. It closes in their face and begins its ascent. In the flickering lights, we see in the dome mirror a figure making its way down the hall, closer and closer each time we get light. The bell on the corpse's toe jingles with each step, and Austin and Tommy stare into the darkness of the hall, the figure barely visible. Austin presses the call button again and again for the elevator, and Tommy takes the axe. Finally, the elevator comes, and Austin rips the door open. He grabs his father and pulls him inside. Tommy presses the button in the elevator, but the doors won't close all the way and the elevator won't move. He stands in the gap in the door as the figure approaches. And when the light flashes, we see it for just a second. Lifeless and faceless, Louis Tannis walks up to the gap in the door. Tommy brings the axe down swiftly, making contact with the remains of Tannis's face. The corpse thuds to the floor. I just want to say that the tension of this scene mm -hmm. is... Fantastic. Oh, yeah. I think that there was a moment towards the end for me where I just felt something is wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way that it's shot, they really lend that feeling of this may not be right. Yeah. yeah. Tommy and Austin catch their breath in the elevator until they hear a weak wheezing outside of it. When Austin goes out to investigate, we now see that on the ground, bleeding from her neck and gasping for air is Emma, who has returned to meet Austin for their date. What the hell? Where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's so nuts because we heard the elevator earlier. Yeah. yeah. Like it all, if you think about it logically, it all makes sense. It, yeah. And it kind of puts me in the mind of uh, something that happened in another film from a few years ago. I don't want to give away uh, which film. Yeah. I will say one of our favorite actors from one of our favorite sitcoms is... <laughs> 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 Not long for this world, but... <laughs> But you know, <laughs> you know, not to give it away. <laughs> right. Austin sobs, holding Emma and pleading helplessly as she slips away. Tommy is lost for words and confused at how this happened. And he, too, begins to cry. The elevator comes back to life and Tommy has to force Austin away from Emma and onto it. As the door closes, Tommy stares down at her body. In the elevator, Austin collapses sobbing to the ground. It begins to rise, but grinds quickly to a halt, causing Tommy to scream and curse. 
Later, they sit on the floor of the elevator, Austin staring forward numbly and Tommy inspecting his side, where the bruises look much, much worse. I got to be honest, man. At this point, I'm not trusting this elevator. Yeah. No. I'm not trusting my own eyes. That, that's the thing. Like. He saw it. Yeah. You can't trust anything now. So what are we even doing? Let's just go back and let her do whatever she's yeah. doing. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever you're going to do, Mrs. Doe. I <laughs> Try to put her back together. I don't know. Yeah, yeah maybe. And just say sorry a bunch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Kiss her on the forehead. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Austin, his eyes filling with tears, tells Tommy that he told Emma to come back. Tommy tells him that he didn't do this. He shouldn't even be here and that this is all his fault. Tommy's. Austin tells him that he couldn't have known and that Tommy says that that's what everyone told him about Austin's mother. He asks if he knows why he used to call her Ray because she was his ray of sunshine. He laughs a little, remembering how corny she thought that was. And he tells his son that if he would have known, he would have helped her. He asks if he knows that. He says that she was always so bright and happy, but he should have known that she was carrying pain and unhappiness every day. He didn't, though, so she had to carry it alone. He says they're all his mistakes and Austin has to pay for them. This is devastatingly heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. We see Jane Doe in the autopsy room and then the crematorium where the fire in the incinerator starts on its own. Austin asks his father why she hasn't just killed them yet. Tommy says that it's not for want of trying, but Austin disagrees. He thinks that if she wanted them dead, they'd be dead. He says that she tried to stop them each time they tried to cut into her, like there's something she doesn't want them to find. We see her body again, staring endlessly as the doors to the incinerator open and flood the floor with smoke. Tommy is bewildered that Austin wants to go back in there, but Austin thinks that if they stay there, then they're dead. If they could just find out how she died, maybe they could find a way to stop her. After a moment of contemplation, they pry the doors open and hop down into the hallway. I understand that they have to do something. But there in in no there is no deal that <laughs> figuring this out she's gonna like be a happy spirit or whatever. Yeah. No, after the fact. There's so. no deal. I will <laughs> I, I mean you have to agree, they're fucked regardless. Yeah. yeah. So let's just turn the skeletons in the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, so I'm gonna lay on the elevator floor and cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Emma is still on the ground, bloody with the axe next to her. Austin kneels over her body and Tommy takes a coat from a rack to cover her face. This finally gets Austin up and the two stare at the smoke filled hallway leading to the autopsy room. We travel with them through the thick smoke. They try not to lose each other, but Tommy sees another figure in the smoke and asks if it's Austin. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not funny. I just don't know. <laughs> Again, I know I keep bringing this up, but on King of the Hill, when Bill keeps getting slapped <laughs> <laughs> for the shit that Dale's talking, this is what it feels like. Why does Tommy... It's just not fair. Uh, didn't he get cut, right? He bled on her? Well, yeah, he Maybe. Did. Maybe you're yeah. right, because I'm like, this is <laughs> very unfair. You know what I was starting to think? Yeah. Was that Tommy might have something to do with this, with Jane Doe's death or something oh. he's like, i haven't seen this i haven't seen oh. Pete in a long time yeah, yeah. and it's like because i fucking put it there <laughs> 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 or something you know yeah and then the fact that they're messing him up specifically yeah. <laughs> i'm it like dark there's yeah. something strange okay, yeah. <laughs> but it's not no briefly we catch a glimpse of irene daniels just before <laughs> <laughs> she attacks tommy <laughs> I gotta be honest. This is this is Tommy and Austin's fault. Yeah, they enter this Hold thick hands. ass fog Hold and they hands. they don't walk in together. Yeah, he's like, I'll I'll take lead or whatever. Yeah, it's like, dude, <laughs> nothing is real here. It's Strawberry Fields, motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. Hold my hand. Yeah, there's no way. <laughs> I swear to God. Let's uh, tie. <laughs> take your shirt off. You grab one end. Yes. Uh, tie it to your wrist. Whatever. I got. Yeah. Let's go. Done. I want to hold your hand. Yeah. <laughs> <Those two> feels- <laughs> <laughs> but Irene continues to attack Tommy. 
He cries out in pain, but Austin can't find him. I think we see Tannis there for a second. Like mm-hmm. it's 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 wild. Yeah, he gets a few licks in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, hold him down. <laughs> hold him. <laughs> I'll pick him up. She's just <laughs> working the body. I just, again, it seems very specific. It does. <laughs> For someone who did not murder Jane Doe. Yeah. Yeah. But between the two of them, Tommy is left again on the ground. I was like, if he's dead, I'm going to be fucking, if that was how he died. <laughs> <laughs> he was beaten was, to death by so ghosts. I was fucking ready to be pissed off. <laughs> but we see a figure shuffling toward him and it disappears Austin finally finds his father and helps him up and they go inside the autopsy room and barricade the door. Was Austin just waiting on the side? <laughs> He's like, He's I like, can't. Oh, yeah, <laughs> There's I'm... nothing I can do. <laughs> I'm not jumping in that. Yeah, yeah. We don't, I don't know what they're capable of. <laughs> Austin gets down to business as his father watches. He makes an incision across Jane Doe's head and peels her scalp back before taking a saw to her skull and opening it up. He notes that her brain looks normal, but Tommy insists that there has to be something. He says that all of her other organs are scarred. Austin removes a piece of the brain and collects it before putting the skull and scalp back in their original positions. He rushes over to the microscope and inspects the piece of brain, causing him to give a horrified, what the fuck? Tommy asks what, but Austin, his eyes wide with fear, can't even speak. Tommy goes over and looks for himself. Underneath the microscope, blood flows and the cells of Jane Doe's brain are very much active. There is there is nothing we can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, after seeing this, no matter how long you've worked in a morgue or done this. Tommy's mm, like, no, 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 this happens, yeah. <laughs> this happens all the time. I've seen this before. <laughs> I just, I think I would just go and talk to Jane Doe. I would just speak to her. Maybe. Like, yeah. as reasonably as I could. We didn't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we just did business as usual. We fucked up a lot tonight. I'll, yeah. I'll be the first to admit it. Can you make it stop, though? <laughs> <laughs> Tommy surmises that that's why they couldn't find the cause of death. She's still alive. A little unhinged now, Austin reminds Tommy that they lit her on fire and took out her heart. They turn back toward her body and Tommy says that there's some energy or something that's keeping her going. Austin inspects the cloth over the light again. When he folds it in on itself, he sees something legible. Tommy goes over for a better look and he reads the newly deciphered words, Leviticus 2027. He hurries to his books and pulls a Bible down. Austin looks at the next collection of Roman numerals and reads them, 1693. Using a magnifying glass, Tommy reads out Leviticus 2027. Any man or woman who consults with the spirits of the dead shall be put to death, for they are... Before he can finish, it all comes together for Austin. 17th century, Northeast, New England. Tommy sets the Bible down wordlessly and Austin reads the rest of the verse. They are a witch and their blood shall be on their own hands. This is not anything that I expected. No. Coming into this film. Uh Uh-uh. I will say the small seeds that were planted through some of the things that they found. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. I was very, very, very pleased by this twist. Yeah. Yeah. And you look great for being that old. Oh, yeah. She looks excellent. Yeah. It's like 400 years. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We thought you were like 25. Yeah. Yeah. No, you probably smoked. (laughs) You probably did all that smoking. (laughs) They look over at Jane Doe, who continues to stare upward. Austin reasons that it fits, but Tommy argues that witches are a myth. Austin tries to tell him to quit denying, but Tommy doubles down that there were no witches in Salem. They were young girls falsely accused. They were all wrapped up in hysteria and pointing to each other. They were all innocent. Tommy says that they didn't hang her or burn her at the stake. They tortured her mercilessly. We see the evidence of this on the chalk drawing of Jane Doe, her shattered bones and her severed tongue. Austin says that it was a ritual that didn't work. 
After a moment of being struck silent, Tommy asks, what if a ritual, because it was performed on an innocent, accidentally created the very thing they were trying to destroy? That is a fascinating concept. I love mm-hmm. it. I will say that Tommy has really switched sides on this issue really yeah. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> There's no denying it at this point. He's leaping. But, I, yeah. <laughs> but th- th- it's it's time. It's he's He already looked. Yeah. He looked at the active brain tissue before he left. Yeah. yeah. She's a witch. Well, she's a witch. <laughs> <laughs> she was made a witch. Yes. Yeah. Which is infinitely more interesting. Yes. And Brian Cox said that in an interview that I watched that he felt that's what compelled him the most besides the relationship between the Tildens Mm -hmm. was the fact that it would have been so much easier to just make her a witch doing bad things. Mm -hmm. But this adds so much more commentary and messaging, really, because she is a victim. Yeah. And this is vengeance. Yeah. Yeah. He mentions everything they did to her and everything that we did to her. She felt all of it and she wants them to feel it too. (laughs) That's why she's been kicking my ass all night. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the lead. (laughs) He raises his shirt, revealing his bruising, which now looks like a symbol. He realizes that that's why she's keeping them alive. This is her revenge. This is her ritual. Austin asks, why us? And Tommy answers with his own questions. Why the Douglases? Why anybody? They were all just stops along her way. The ones that survived buried her as far as they could. Austin says that that didn't stop her, though. Tommy replies that it's because no one has gotten close enough. No one could have been able to see what they saw tonight until then. He says that she's still suffering and it's not going to stop until... He trails off and Austin asks, until what? Tommy doesn't answer him, so he asks again. Before Tommy can voice his answer, something starts banging at the doors to the autopsy room again. Austin runs to them and holds the door shut, but Tommy doesn't go to help him. Instead, he leans over Jane Doe and whispers to her that he won't fight her. He pleads with her, though. Please just don't hurt him. Austin calls to Tommy for help, but suddenly the lights dim. Jane Doe stares up at Tommy, and he stares back at her. His mouth moves helplessly, but no words come out. His face flushes, and he turns from Jane Doe, grunting in pain. The corpse trying to get inside stops its banging, and Austin rushes over to his father. Tommy holds his hands out for both of them to watch his wrists shatter. Underneath the skin, Jane Doe's bones fix themselves. The same happens when Tommy's ankles shatter and he drops to the ground. He continues screaming and writhing in pain as Jane Doe's incision and organs heal themselves. The spilt blood begins to reverse its route and go back into her body. Tommy exhales a cloud of smoke as her lungs repair themselves. Tommy falls onto his back, his eyes wide and his face twisted in agony. His eyes go cloudy as Jane Doe's clear to a deep, rich brown. I feel like this wasn't what Tommy had in mind. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't think that's the deal he was making. I will say that I think I'm not, I'm a little uncertain how I feel about this process not finishing. Okay. Because I don't know. I think it would be more interesting for me if we get more of Jane Doe. Yeah. Then what happens next? Yeah. Yeah. So kind of like maybe like an Uncle Frank situation where, he, you know, he needed her to kill people <laughs> to get well, the skin. Yeah, to, to come get back. The skin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's all Jada Which, was. <laughs> yeah. If it's happening to somebody else, she was repairing herself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So but then the question is, is she repairing herself to come back to life or Ooh. is she repairing herself to be prepared to go to the next destination? That this is, way. Oh, okay. That is the question. So I'm, I'm intrigued, but I'm also full of questions. Yes. Austin sits over his father as Tommy turns his head to look at a scalpel on the ground. He looks back at Austin, who can only shake his head. Tommy chokes out, please. When he starts to groan again, it's cut short when Austin stabs his father, giving Tommy the mercy of ending his life. I was very shocked. Yeah. Yeah. By that, I thought he would. What I thought was going to happen is he 
kind of cradles his father as this continues. Mm-hmm. And then we see two feet angle off of the slab uh-huh. yeah. and stand behind him. That's what I thought was going to happen. Okay. I was very sad to see him go. Yeah. He didn't deserve any of it. No. no. But, but neither did she. No. Nope. No. Yeah. No. Nope. I think that's the point. Yes. I mean, th- it just, it, when you start this horrific cycle, it just keeps going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, this was to me another thing that he learned from his dad from the cat. Yeah. Because I was like, why did that have to happen? But yeah. that happened for this. Fair I point. Think. That's fair. Tommy slips away quietly and Austin sobs. As he sits, trying to catch his breath, the lights turn back on. The drawers to the freezers are neatly closed. The radio comes back to life. Someone calls out to Austin and he recognizes it to be Burke's voice. Covered in Emma and Tommy's blood, Austin goes out into the hallway where his girlfriend's corpse still lies. Burke calls out that they're sawing down the tree holding the door shut. He promises to be right with them. His eyes wild. Austin looks around and steps over Emma, rushing to the cellar doors. He tries to open them as Burke instructs, but they still won't budge. Tears pouring from his eyes, Austin yells that he can't open it. But Burke continues to yell, open up. His yell turns into a sing as he belts out the song from the radio. Open up your heart and let the sunshine in. So let the sunshine in. Face it with a grin. I can't believe he's been requesting this song all night. (laughs) (laughs) It was Sheriff (laughs) Bird. No, this moment is fantastic. It scared me. Like in the the he's belting this song. Yes. And it's just absolutely frightening. Yeah. And it's the I was out. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And I will say as well, I got a lot to say of <laughs> <laughs> And one more thing. And one more thing. I'm Columbo. <laughs> I was actually very worried about him having to explain all this. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Well, we continue. Yeah. We continue. <laughs> Horrified. Austin stops trying to open the door and backs up against the railing. When he hears the bell, he looks down onto the hallway below him. Bert continues to sing, and when Austin turns back in that direction, he is face to face with Tommy, pale faced and staring out with cloudy eyes. Austin screams as the railing behind him breaks and he falls backwards. The light flickers as we hear him crash to the floor below. His neck broken, Austin stares out into the hallway endlessly. We see his view of the autopsy room door, and it cuts to black. The next morning, the outside of the Tilden Morgue and Crematorium looks picturesque and serene. The police arrive and find the inside anything but. Evidence tags mark the location of Austin's body, and he is clean. That's, a, I don't he even. He was splattered yeah. with both Tommy and Emma's blood. There's not a drop on him now. Burke stares down at him before turning and walking away. He sees the shattered mirror in the office bathroom, the hole the axe made in the autopsy room door. Finally, he sees Tommy lying on the floor, completely normal, clean, and healthy, aside from the scalpel sticking out of his heart. Which I don't think it where did he stab him in the it looked i had written that he stabbed him in the stomach Mm because that's what it the angle that's what it looked like (laughs) it did it was a weird placement it 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 appeared to be maybe in the rib Mm -hmm. or yeah something but but not sticking straight up no they find it yeah i don't recall that no lieutenant wade comments that there aren't any signs of forced entry and it looks an awful lot like But Burke interrupts her. He says that he's known the Tildens for 20 years. Whatever it looks like, that ain't it. And can we put two and two together and say everywhere we take this body? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think he gets there. (laughs) We didn't stop her. No. This is a problem now. (laughs) He looks over Jane Doe's information on the chalkboard. The weather report on the radio announces another nice one out there. The fourth straight day of sunshine. This caught me off guard a lot Mm -hmm. because the first time I watched it, I didn't hear what he had said on the radio earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And so the second time I went around and watched it, I was like, wow. So this whole time, 
there has never been a storm. Yeah. Nope. None of that happened at all. Yeah. Nope. So it's just, it's, it's, uh, she was very busy that night. <laughs> she was. <laughs> <laughs> Burke opens the drawers to find Louis Tannis and Irene Daniels in their proper places. He ponders what the hell happened here. Standing over Jane Doe's body, Wade asks what he wants to do with her. Burke tells her to get Jane Doe out of here. But when Wade mentions another funeral home, he reiterates, get her out of my county. He gives her somewhere else to take her, telling her to let them deal with her. Wade nods and walks away. We finally get a look at Jane Doe. Her eyes are open and cloudy and her skin is pale and flawless, untouched by any autopsy instruments. She is draped with a sheet, placed on a gurney and loaded into a van. I, I kind of I thought that he would maybe say something about the fact that the autopsy hadn't been started mm-hmm. even. Yeah. Because that's a little strange, especially yeah. with the urgency he came in there with. Yeah, uh-huh. that's true. Outside, Burke watches solemnly as the rest of the bodies are loaded into the coroner's van. Did we ever see Emma? I think when he walked in. Mm. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's really dead. That sucks. Yeah. yeah. That happened. Behind the wheel of the van, Trooper Cole, played by Parker Sawyers, is engaged in a conversation, resulting in the person on the other end advising him that the word of God is powerful. Suddenly, their voice is overtaken by static, and the song begins to play again. Open up your heart and let the sun shine in. So let the sun shine in. Face it with a grin. Smilers never lose and frowners never win. So let the sunshine in. We slide behind Trooper Cole and find that he's transporting Jane Doe. We glide down her body to her feet as the song continues. Her right big toe is tagged. And just as her left big toe twitches slightly, we get the bright jingle of a bell. It cuts to black and the credits roll. So. What did you guys think about the autopsy of Jane Doe? Uh, so first off, wiggle your big toe. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I did enjoy this movie. Um, I'm a little confused. So she's just going to bounce from place to place. It never stops. Um, are the Warrens ever going to get called? I mean, what? Like, <laughs> I don't think it's, so. Uh, yeah, I don't, <laughs> this I don't is think terrifying. That, that crossover is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I do enjoy the idea of this, and I did enjoy this movie. I like what's going on, but now I just kind of want to know more. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Of Jane Doe's backstory, of or maybe where else has she been, or what? You know what I mean? The, what made them dig her up if she was in the house? You know what I mean? Did they hear something? Yeah. What led up to it? What it, it it I do like it, but it does open more questions. Oh well, he was doing work for them. He was doing work in their house, so maybe he was working in the basement and found her on accident. And then, okay, but and then all, yeah. hell, broke all hell broke loose. Yeah. Because what okay. does what does it look like happened at the morgue? Oh, it looks like a murder. Yeah. Yeah. And that's place. what it looked like at that house. Yeah, but what the hell are you doing in my basement digging in the floor? What do you need to go down? <laughs> that, what are you going deeper for? Maybe he was putting a pool in there. We don't, <laughs> we, we don't know what right, they're doing. All right, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> in Grantham, Virginia. Yeah, I don't you know. know. I don't know what they do there. Uh, but it is a good movie, and I did enjoy that. That is, And I think you're right, T. I think this is one of those late night kind of uh, cuddle up and watch the movie or just, you know, get you some popcorn or whatever. It's like, man, I'm not going to sleep after this. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experience. Yeah. And I, I do really enjoy it. I do wonder with them punctuating the entire film on that line about God being powerful. Mm-hmm. Is this part of their messaging as far as like what happened at Salem and the idea of maybe what you think is good is actually not mm, right. being wrapped up in some kind. You know, I feel like there's a lot of commentary here that that kind of doesn't uh, happen. Or maybe it's so subtle that I just don't grasp it. Yeah. But I, I think that them ending it on that line is very interesting. Okay. It is. To try to figure out what they're trying to say with this picture <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i do i really enjoy it it's it's a lot of um i want to say fun but what happens really isn't <laughs> no <laughs> fun but it, it's an experience that is like a thrill ride so i don't know what to call it yeah 
I really enjoy the atmosphere. I like the story. Mm-hmm. Um, I did read in an interview that they had talked about possibly doing a prequel. Okay. So, I mean, it is possible that we do learn more. I am interested, but I don't know at the same time. Mm-hmm. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. You know? Part of me would be right there to watch it. And the other part is like, don't fuck it up. Like, don't. <laughs> Do don't do too much. Yeah, because what you have is a really, really contained supernatural horror film, mm-hmm. and I feel like what we get is enough. I will say that the third act does seem kind of rushed. A little, a yeah. little bit. Like them getting picked off, him, him getting his ass kicked, and then her <laughs> <laughs> pulling the old switcheroo, and then yeah, <laughs> gets his ass kicked twice. He yeah, does. Yeah. It's it's a lot. And I will say that Austin's death is very quick as well. Yeah. A little anticlimactic for everything that's happened. Yeah. But I mean, I guess if you're going to tell this story and spin this yarn at the same as the same as what happened to the family in the first house, mm-hmm. it kind of has to go this way. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, while I'm a little torn on the third act, I get why they did everything. But for a movie that with credits w- or without credits is 81 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there could have been a little more... Um, fleshing out of certain aspects okay but that doesn't mean i'm dissatisfied yeah i think what i got is fantastic yeah Yeah. no i agree i i think that this one really needs to be talked about more i think that it is a fantastic film i think the horror in it there are times when it is so successful that i'm like i genuinely creeped out the part with the singing Yes. The whole the whole ending to me was just very unexpected because you would think that Tommy being like, look, I get it. OK, like you deserve your revenge. Just leave my son out of it. Like you either think that a that's what she needed and she'll stop mm-hmm. or B, she will take him and leave Austin alone. Yeah. But she like it. The, just this messaging of you took this innocent person and you made this monster Mm -hmm. and it's not going to stop but that was done to her like i that there's just something so um like poetic and terrible and like true about that um because i was not expecting austin to to get it to get got at all yeah really i didn't either for a second when uh tommy was turning i was like oh okay so she did make the deal yeah and then when he did die i was like oh you're a fucking liar well, but, I mean, <laughs> she never said that. that she was like, uh, how about? But. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's like, I didn't shake anyone's hand. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember doing that. <laughs> but just the fact that right after Tommy dies, Burke is like, we're coming in. Like, it just felt like, OK, that was it. You made the deal. Mm-hmm. She's satisfied. You know, Austin's going to have a lot of explaining to do, but yeah. he's yeah. alive. Uh uh-uh. uh. It's just so tragic and sad for a family that has already been through so much. Mm -hmm. And this character of Austin that has this trajectory of moving on and, and, you know, kind of forging his own path for it all to be cut short. It's just, it's, it's devastating, but that's what happened to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we never even learn her name. It's just so sad. Like, it's so sad. And then thinking a little bit deeper about what you said about the God comment at the end, mm-hmm. I'm like, is is it a statement on like those platitudes? Like even that song that's just like, oh, um, smilers never lose, you know, but it's like, n- no, that's not true. Like, look what happened this to all these people that didn't deserve it back then in the 1600s and even tonight in this morgue and yeah. there's also the line in the song i think is something about mother told me to hate taught me to hate the devil yeah who decides what the devil is yeah, yeah. that's also See, you know man, mm-hmm. i'm telling you this movie is it's special like it's yeah. there's something about it that just i don't know it really hit me this time around and even talking about it it's like there's so much commentary there and so much of a conversation to have that i just um I really, I, I just really love it. I really appreciate it. But I guess we can go into ratings. Sure. I mean, I think we kind of went over everything. Um, I will say I will agree with you to a point about the, the third act feeling a bit, a bit rushed. And there are some more questions. And, um, you know, it kind of, it this uh, subtlety and quietness that we get at the beginning kind of like, 
ramps up to madness at the end. And that's not even necessarily a bad thing, but it does almost feel like two different styles. Yeah. When you kind of zoom out and look at it collectively. Mm -hmm. But that being said, anything that could be construed as negative or, you know, kind of just like, "Eh, well, I didn't love that. It's, it's really, um, it, the, it's so I don't I guess overshadowed by the things that I love about it um, but I, I will admit that it's not perfect right. I do think that it is excellent though and that if you have not seen it you should watch it because it needs its flowers like I mm-hmm. feel like like I've said already before it's not talked about enough and this is a really fucking great and genuinely scary at times horror movie Yeah, and very thoughtful and smart I would say so on a scale from one to ten, inexplicably injured organs. Ah. <laughs> I'm gonna give the autopsy of Jane Doe nine out of ten. Inexplicably injured organs. I really, really loved this. I love a good revenge story. I love. I mean, I think this would count as a feminine rage story. Well, I mean, we're bringing up the Salem witch trial. You know. Yeah. Um. This is excellent, Mm -hmm. and you should watch it. (laughs) (laughs) But I will now open up the floor. Yeah, uh, I did have a lot of fun with with the movie. Um, I had a lot of fun talking about it. Mm -hmm. I I do want to... I think you're right. If there's a prequel, we're going to be happy and angry (laughs) at the same time, Mm -hmm. so... There is, there's, there's no pleasing us. That's just, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. That's yeah, the nature the, of it. <laughs> but I will watch it. Yes. Um, but I, I think for me, that's the only, that's the only real, uh, I don't want to say downside to it, but it does leave me with questions. And even if that, so then the, again, it's just this, it's just a nonstop murder thon. Like every time Jane Doe hits the scene, you know what I mean? Everybody's dead. Yeah. It's like, okay, so what do we do to stop this? Oh, you can't. Okay, well, why not? Can I know a little more? <laughs> why yeah. Not? It's like, well, you know, I, <laughs> can we make a deal? Can we? What <laughs> no. Are, yeah. You know, um, mm-hmm. was there a connection between him saying he called his wife his sunshine or his oh. ray of light and then the Jane Doe's thing being sunshine or come outside or whatever. I mean, I don't know, Um, but it is very good and I did enjoy it and I was very surprised by it. Um, I would, I would watch this again and I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this is a movie that would probably grow on me a little more as I watch it. Like I said, for me, it it wasn't great, but it is really, really good. So I think for me on a scale from one to 10, inexplicably injured organs yep i'm gonna give the autopsy of jane doe a seven i did enjoy it and i like i said i'm sure with more watches i'll enjoy it more and more um but i i do i do i do feel the same way the the last of the movie did feel a little rushed and kind of like okay we need to get to a place let's let's hurry and get there Mm -hmm. um but but like you you too i agree with you that doesn't mean i wasn't satisfied no i did enjoy it but it did you could feel the you know what i mean that we got to get there let's go (laughs) i yeah i agree with both of you on basically everything (laughs) (laughs) i my thing is that again it's just kind of what happens in the third act where we kind of go from those more subtle moments to kind of more conventional horror Okay. Like the jump scare kind of situation. Yeah. 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 Ghost house pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vanity plate. Um, everyone knows that skeleton I'm talking about, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> I've only, I said it a lot. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, on the positive side, the atmosphere, the performances, cinematography, the film just has a great feel. Yeah. The production design, the music. I really appreciate some of the ideas that they're trying to explore. I think I just want more exploration. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be spoon fed, but I think I want to kind of get there. I don't know. Because I feel like a lot of it feels like speculation. 
Yeah. Could this be what they were meaning with this? Could this be what they were going for? That's fair. And I want, I mean, I don't know, because I feel like with what you're referencing, the Salem witch trials, Mm -hmm. victimization of innocent people. Yeah. Like, I feel like these are really, really rich themes that can be explored a little deeper. Yeah. And maybe you are doing kind of a surface level situation to let us kind of fill in the blanks and Mm -hmm. discover our own meaning through it. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. Or maybe it's just a, you know, real good film to watch at night. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. And I did want to mention, I meant to mention it at the intro, but I had read an article, I think it was Entertainment Weekly. Mm -hmm. Stephen King had tweeted about the autopsy of Jane Doe, and he compared the suspense and the execution of it to Alien. All right. And early Cronenberg. Okay. Okay. And so I was intrigued the fact that he would say that, and I do feel a very classic horror atmosphere. Yeah. And the suspense that they do build... I, I mean, there's a lot to enjoy here, and I just, you know, maybe diving into it a little bit more, I'll enjoy it a little bit more in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I do enjoy it a lot now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of things. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's good. It's yeah. good. It's good. S apostrophe good. <laughs> uh, but for me, out of 10 inexplicably injured organs. That's it. I'm going to give the autopsy of Jane Doe 7.5 out of 10 inexplicably injured organs. I really uh, appreciate a lot of this film. I just feel like at the end, it just, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all from us at Podmortem. What would you rate the autopsy of Jane Doe and which we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at the Podmortem. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Blood and Smoke, at Juggalo Daddy 84, and at Travis MWH. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at Blood and Smoke, at Real Streeter 84, and at Travis MWH. Thank you again to Original Cinematic for sponsoring this week's episode. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special shout out to our Wendigo Getter patrons. And remember, don't be swept up in society's witch hunts. Those vile accusations may just become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned for a special shout out to our Wendigo Getter patrons. Woo! Yeah! There you go. All right. We brought it back. (laughs) (laughs) A special thank you to... Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Lala Thomas, Travis and Nisa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Jennifer Perez, Allison O'Neill, Carissa, TJ and Angie Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Applin Ontiveros, Karima Rhodes, Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Sydney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, J.D. Rizak, Molly Gerhardt, Armand Spasto, Aaron Aguirre, Eggy, William Berry, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Jordan Roberts, Dylan, Melissa Sierra, Holly Bryan, Jordan Blevins, Liz Heath, Spencer Montalvo, Pancake the Panda, John Ramos, Michael Newding, Alexis Roberts, Dan Laveau, Itzy M, Gary Horton, Leisha Olivier, Kate Lamp, Carlos and Sydney, Jessica Hunter, Helena Rudder, Alan Johnston, Mariah, Livy Fun, Mandy M, Scott Troutman Wise, Mozzie Bear, Brittany G, Dave Burke, Adrian Stakes, Daniel McGinnis, Nick Spill, Emma Hagel Kissinger, Valerie G, Emiliana, Brian Glass, CB, Taylor Santana, Will Lewison, Angelique, Smelly Poo Poo Head, Beth Bauer, Cookie, Esperanza J, Jason Kyle OKC, Joshua Rumley, Danielle Peralta, Brandon, Nicholas Carter, Sawyer Reese Farr, Dr. Diva Loves Horror, Girl That's Scary, Cassandra, Andrea Simmons, Ashley Hagetta, William and Zena Rush, Ryan Brom, Megan Ochoa, Laura Lassiter, Natalie de Guzman, Eileen O, Marissa E, Sydney, Henry F., Megan M, Strangely Sarah, Christy Beck, Nancy and Andy, Amanda Lopez, Andy Terrell, Jason Hanavan, Abigail Spitzer, Katie K, Erica Morin, Cameron S, Nicole Stewart, Tris Wynn, K.87, Mariah Jensen, 
Carrie A, Lonnie Lono, Powell, Kayla E, Maggie H, Fernando Dominguez, Murderstina, No Thanks Tom Hanks, Kevin McConaughey, Kristen Marcy, Ori81 Boricua, Look Like That One Girl, Bog Boy, Felnez 63, Alita Pui, Probably My Jugs, Kate Thackeray, Wade Pack, Charlie V, A Lizard, Bay J, Luke Ashley, J Rich, Jen Lassiter, Topher Williams, Elena Mettler, Neil Chesson, Valerie K, Kim Sterling, Christy Lee Kruger, Professor of Humanities, Laura McCarricker, Naomi, Josh Smith, Autumn Green, Jess L, Eats L, Heather Santiano, Abby Kopp, Crystal 831, Cassidy Carruthers, Skank Sinatra, Morgan Alexander, Tony Osteen, Julie Fredborg, Rihanna S., Daniel Taylor, Anna Kate, Heather Ortiz, and Jen T. Thank you. Woo! Thank you so much. Thank you all. And I got to say, of course, thank you all Hmm. for hanging with us. You stole my bit! (laughs) 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 Until next time. (laughs) 